Welcome, everyone. This is Michael Gibbs, and I'm the founder and CEO of Go Cloud Architects and Go Cloud Careers. And I'm here today to have some real fun with you. We're going to discuss BGP training, and this is really networking for cloud computing. And whether you choose to call it AWS BGP, or consider this to be an AWS networking tutorial, or even a discussion of what is BGP, the key is we're going to discuss networking for cloud computing. Whether you call that cloud networking training or networking and cloud computing or networking for cloud architects, this is really essential stuff. It is critical network skills training. And here's why. The cloud is nothing more than a network and a data center that's been virtualized. So the critical cloud architect skills are knowing the network and the data center. So when people ask me for cloud architect career tips, I say the network and the data center, specifically BGP. IP addressing, subnetting, supernetting. So if you want to be a cloud architect, if you're looking to get a cloud architect job or you're looking for cloud career tips, we're going to have a party with this AWS BGP training. And this is really BGP for cloud computing. I love BGP. I've worked with it now for over 25 years. I'm one of the original Cisco certified internet experts back when it was a two-day exam. And let me tell you, I have over 10,000 hours of BGP experience spent nearly a decade as a lead architect over at Cisco, and BGP is what makes me happy. It's my absolute favorite thing in the world. Before we talk about BGP, and trust me, there's nothing more fun than talking about BGP, I'd like to do just a little bit of housekeeping. So first, everybody, welcome! And uh, if you're here and you're having a good time, type hashtag cloud hired. The whole reason we do this is to get you all cloud hired. So type hashtag cloud hired. Ciao, I'm loving seeing you there with the blue wrench. Io, I'm so happy to see you there. Tobias, I'm happy to see you there. A fantastic cloud hired. So let's go over a few things. Today, on today's uh, question and answer session, we decided to open up a flash sale. So currently, until the end of this month, there's 28 days in... Uh, February, so we're decided to do a 28% flash sale good until the end of uh, January. So if you're interested, please go and get yourselves cloud hired. Join our community. That's the uh, coupon code. It's February flash, 28% off. We almost never do this. So help yourselves get cloud hired. We'd love to work with you. We'd love to hear from you. And that's why we do what we do. Everything is all about getting you cloud hired. So love seeing that cloud hired stuff. Additionally, I wanted to let you know that tomorrow we have a webinar on how to get your first cloud architect job. We will discuss what the hiring managers desire. We will discuss how to skip HR and get your resume directly in the hands of the hiring manager. We will talk about, just bear with me, I'm trying to make mute my phone because it beeps nonstop. We will tell you exactly what you need to know, what is the technical competency, what you need to do on an interview, what should be on your resume. Literally speaking, we will tell you everything to get hired. And it's completely free, so join us on Thursday for that, which is tomorrow. And on Friday, to help you get hired, because everything is about getting you guys cloud hired, we're going to have a completely free interview demo. People typically pay me about $400 an hour for interview coaching. And guess what? We're going to invite you all for free, and we're going to give you interview coaches. So apply, apply, apply to be part of this. Chris from my team will put down the sign up link. Let's get every one of you cloud hired. So now you know what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about BGP today. We went over the housekeeping. And also, one more last thing we also have a completely free AWS Certified Solution Architect Professional Book. It starts at the beginning and it gets you all the way to passing the exam. There are a tremendous number of wonderful people that worked into putting that together to help you all get nothing else other than. Cloud hired, so please take advantage of it. But today we're going to talk about BGP or the Border Gateway Protocol, which is my absolute, absolute favorite routing protocol in the world. So to begin, what is BGP? Why do we use by BGP? And we're going to have to get pretty technical here. And I wish we didn't, I didn't have to put my hat on with the propellers around it, but let's just say we're going to get really geeky and really technical here. And we just have no choice. We have to do this. So BGP is a routing protocol. And why do we use routing protocols? We use routing protocols to build the map of our network. 
so we can find the destination. So realistically speaking, I want you to think about this. If you want to call a friend on your phone, you dial their number, right? The phone switches, route the call to the right person, their phone rings, and they say, hi, it's me, I'm Mike. That's all great, right? But somehow the magic in between was the routing. Now, there's lots of ways we can set up our routing. We can set it up where we can tell a router, go here to reach this. It's called static routing. What's that like? Well, let's say I want to go visit Chris. He's over in that, in that Tampa, St. Petersburg area. Here I am just north of Palm Beach County. So what do I do? I would look at a map. This is a static route. And I would say, go up I-95 North. Make a left. Make a right. Make a left. Make a right. And poof, I'm at Chris's house. Great, right? Well, what happens if there's some traffic on the road? What happens if there's construction? If a road's blocked? Well, if I have a static route, I am stuck. I can get halfway to Chris's house, not know where to go. I can't get there. Now, what if I got in my car and I said, hey, GPS, take me to Chris's house. And I'm on the way to Chris's house. I'm in my car. I'm driving. Life's good. I got my cat Cindy on my lap because she doesn't go very far without me. Driving to Chris's house and whoa, construction. My GPS says, rerouting. Make a left. Make a right. Make a left. I don't get stuck. So in networking, or in calls, in voice over IP, or in routing, we have to build a map to get to the destination. We have a choice where we can manually configure this, but that doesn't scale. Imagine talk, going to 30,000 routers in your environment and manually telling it each place to go. And then say, well, go here. But if this doesn't work, go here. But if this doesn't work, go here. But if that doesn't work, go here. Could you imagine doing this on 20,000 different devices? You'd be lost. You just can't do it. So what we need is we need that GPS-like functionality. How do I get my data through the network? And with that, we need to build a map. And that's called the routing protocol. So we have lots of cool routing protocols that can do it. We have interior gateway protocols and exterior gateway protocols. And we'll talk about what they are in a minute. Inside of an organization, we run something called an interior gateway protocol, such as OSPF, or intermediate systems to intermediate systems. Or a million and one years ago, we used something called EIGRP, or IGRP, or RIP, although we haven't been using distance vector protocols like that for ages. But the point is, is it's a routing protocol. They build a map. Now, inside of an organization, we have routing protocols that are tuned for speed, speed, fast. Why is it fast? Why does it matter? Well, in a small environment, you got a cable cut, you want to reroute around it really fast, right? So in our own organizations, what we need is this. We need speed, performance, and rapid self-healing. Now, that's great. We want speed. Now, what comes with speed? Well, less scalability. So, now think about that. Speed means less scalable because we have to do more stuff, more stuff. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Routing protocols and tier gate ones are optimized for speed. They send hello messages really fast. They withdraw routes really fast. They add them really fast because we're looking for self-healing. Now, in between organizations, we're looking for scalability. So an interior gateway routing protocol like OSPF has three or 4,000 routes in it. That's about it. Oh, it's going to survive nicely. Whereas BGP can take in 800,000 routes from 10 different internet service providers and it can scale. BGP can let you tune it. I can look there and I can say, Angelo, you've got access to the information. AJ, you have access to the information. I have access to the information. But Kenya, you do not. Now, Kenya would get access to all kinds of information. She's fantastic. And I know her. But that's a point BGP gives me the tunability to say, Jennifer can know about it and Queen can't. But LM can know about it and Chris can't. We get that tunability. So we get scalability, 800,000 rounds versus a few thousand. We've got tunability and we've got a lot of what we like to call nerd knobs. And we'll be playing with those nerd knobs to engineer our traffic. And wow, the nerd knobs are fun and they're cool. But like I said, I'm going to put on my geeky propeller hat with the two propellers because we're going to have to get a little techie over here.
Normally, I just discuss leadership and emotional intelligence, other architecture things. But sometimes we got to get down our, got our hands dirty and get uh, decky. And we're getting techy here. So keep that in the back of your mind. So the way routing protocols build the map through the network. And if you've not seen our CCNA training, attend that free boot camp. It's live on our channel. Please do that. But the way routers have is routers have interfaces. They're like arms, like an octopus with a bunch of limbs. So the way it works is I've got data coming in on one arm, and it goes out another interface. Comes into this side of me, goes out the next side. Comes in from one interface, goes out another interface. Comes in from the bottom, comes out the top. And that's what the routers are doing. They're making this list. That list is called the routing table. So that's what we're doing. And that's what BGP is. And BGP is a dynamic routing protocol. Well, let's talk about the way BGP works. It's not like any other routing protocol. Normally speaking, you have routing protocols that say hello to each other. Hello. 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 And they automatically form a neighbor relationship. Put two OSPF speaking routers in the same subnet, they form an adjacency. Put two routers running CLNS routing or intermediate systems to intermediate systems, they form neighbor relationships. Pop in uh, some interfaces into EIGRP and everybody forms neighbor relationships and it's all perfect. Not BGP. See, every one of these other devices sends a hello via multicast. Hello, and everybody says, hello, and they all say, hello, and they all say, hello, and they form neighbors. Not BGP. BGP, you must manually tell it who's going to form a neighborship, or neighbor relationship with. So think about this. Interior gateway protocols, IP multicast, one to everybody. Exterior gateway protocol, BGP. TCP, and guess what? Test question. TCP port 179 is what BGP uses. TCP port 179. Why did I say that twice? Well, yes, you will see it on your exam. But more importantly, what if you have a firewall between a BGP router on one side and a BGP router on the other side? If that firewall does not allow TCP port 179 through, BGP will never establish a session, never establish a... Uh, Never establish a, a, a pairing relationship. Never exchange routes. So now you know TCP is BGP port 179. So remember, normal routing protocols, multicast. BGP unicast, which means you must manually, manually, manually specify who the neighbor is. I want to connect to Kenya, and Kenya's IP address is 1234. I do a neighbor neighbor, one, two, three, four, and, the, and I put in her autonomous system number, and now Kenya and I could talk to each other. But I've got to manually specify that. So think about this. Regular routing protocols, they form neighbor adjacencies. Not BGP. You've got to manually tell it who you want to pair with. So that automatically increases your security. I have agreed to share information with uh, Kenya Carl on the list. She and I are sharing information. We've manually agreed it. And I'm even going to protect, I'm going to use a form of authentication to see that Kenya is truly Kenya because I don't want to be accepting routing information if she's not really Kenya. I know Kenya. She's awesome. She's trustworthy. She's one of my students. She's an amazing cloud architect. So because of that, I'm happy to exchange routing information with her. Okay, so we talked about the point of BGP. And... We talked about it being TCP-based. We talked about the purpose of scalability. We talked about the purpose of connecting to external entities, such as cloud providers or internet service providers, et cetera, et cetera. Now we start getting into the weeds. Let's talk about the messages that are sent between BGP pairs, because these messages are critical. We're going to be dealing with a couple of messages. One of them is going to be called an open message. The next message is going to be something called a keep alive. Beyond that, we'll talk about updates and we will talk about notifications. And then we're going to get pretty heavy into the algorithm itself because you're going to have to know the algorithm in order to traffic engineer. But let's begin with the open message. So remember, T BGP is TCP. So what ultimately happens is soon as the routers on both sides that are running BGP establish a TCP session, both neighbors send an open message. So pretty much this. You've got Kenya Carl on the other of the line. 
We shake hands. That's part of the TCP session negotiation. And I say, open Kenya. And she says, openly. Now, in these open messages that are there, we're going to have some information. We'll talk about the VGP version number. They have to be the same. If I want to appear with, with Kenya over there, guess what? We have to be using the same VGP version. Hopefully, it's version 4. Autonomous system number. If my autonomous system is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and her autonomous system is 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, guess what? Well, now we have an external or EVGP peering session. If my autonomous number is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and Kenya's autonomous system is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, now we have internal VGP, and the rules are completely different. The next thing that's part of that open message is a hold timer. And what is the hold timer? The hold timer is the maximum number of seconds that can elapse before a router must receive a keep alive or an update message. So why? So, you know, apparently I have a, people know me from the way I view a health check. But here's what it's like. A BGP speaker is going to send a, hey, are you there message? And the other one's going to say, hey, I'm here. Hey, are you there? And that's kind of like a keep alive. Make sure the session is up. So, you know, when you're dealing with these kind of things, you know, kind of keep that in the back of your mind. That well, everything has a hold time, whether it's a health check on DNS, whether it's a health check with regards to the load balancer, it's all the same. Hey, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hey, are you there? Yes, I'm here. And there's also in the open message going to be a BGP identifier. Hey, that's the IP. That's basically the highest loopback address that's on the router or whatever you tell it to be. So that's neither here nor there. But it's an open message. Hello, I'm here. Hello, I'm here. Uh, here's my BGP type version number. Here's my autonomous system number. Here's how long I'm willing to wait without having a message to do something. And here's my BGP identifier. So that's kind of like the open negotiation. It's kind of like uh, the beginning of something. No. Kenya and I established a peering session. She shared some routes with her organization. I've shared some routes with my organization. Everything's great, right? Now, periodically, maybe it's every 10 seconds, or periodically, Kenya says, I'm here, Mike. Are you there, Mike? And I say, I'm here, Kenya. Are you there, Kenya? And she says, I'm here. And I say, good, Kenya, I'm here. Are you here? And she says, Kenya, I'm here. Now, if she doesn't respond or I don't respond, we're going to ultimately tear down that neighbor relationship, and we'll talk about that later. But the key is we have to make sure that the session is established. And apparently my microphone just fell off my shirt. Bear with me for a second. Let's put it back on. I knew I was hearing some strange sounds there. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So what will happen is if the peer doesn't send a keep alive, neighbor relationship goes down. Wait, DNS, health check. Are you there? Are you there? Are you there? No response. Switch over to something else. Load balancer. Are you there? Are you there? Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Good. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Are you there? No. Are you there? No. Are you there? No. Remove the server. It's the same thing. So granted, when we talk about load balancers and health checks and DNS, it makes us feel like it's exciting. BGP did this 30 years ago. It's not new. The health check concept, all of this stuff, all this cloud stuff is old networking thing. And that's why we love BGP so much. Not only is BGP a critical cloud architect skill, but it's a critical network engineer skill. It's needed everywhere. So we talked about the open message, which identifies who we are. We talked about the keep the live message being kind of like a health check. Hey, I'm here. Hey, I'm here. Now let's talk about an update message. So Kenya and I, we're peers. She's sending me information. I'm sending her information. Hey, wait. I just lost a route to a subnet. I don't want to send Kenya information to a subnet that I can no longer reach. So I sent a withdrawal message. I've got access to a new subnet. Guess what? I'm going to send it back. And really, that's what we're looking to do. Sorry, Kenya, you popped in and you responded to one of those things. So I used you as an example. But Kenya is a phenomenal cloud architect. She's got some good networking knowledge and a lot of knowledge in a lot of places. So I don't think she'd mind. So that update message is really talking about new things. Got a new route, lost a route, got a new route, lost a route. So how does it work? We form an adjacency. We do this by basically sending an open message. Hello, are you there? Hello, hello, hello. We agree to our terms. After that's negotiated, then we send keep alive. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. 
And then after that, what do we do? When we get a route, it gets moves away, we withdraw it. We add it, we withdraw it. So these are the kind of things. See, Kenya's over there saying she doesn't mind at all. I wouldn't pick up somebody's name that I didn't think would be pretty happy. So, you know, here's what we're doing when we're talking about the message types in BGP. So we're going to talk about neighbor relationships next, and we will. And we're going to get involved in a lot of hands-on, practical, architectural work. We're having fun. But we're going to have to get to another techie section. So let's do this. I want to cover this message. I'm going to open it up for a few minutes of questions. And then after that, we'll get back to the content. So let's lastly talk about the notification message. So Kenya and I are having our conversation and something, everything is good. We're happy. We're happy. And then something happens funny. Well, this is when a notification message is sent. So maybe I'm trying to speak BGP4 to Kenya who's speaking BGP3. Well, that's not going to work. So we've got to have something. So what happens, there's a concept of a notification message where if anything goes wrong, it just closes the session. That's the way it works. If anything goes wrong, it just closes the session. So we're going to take some questions from the audience. If you're having a good time, if you could hit that like button, if you could subscribe and hit the bell, we have a lot of special stuff coming for you very soon. And if you hit that bell, you will be notified of it. So before I get in too much, because the next section we're going to get into is pretty, pretty, pretty techy, and uh, it's we're going to have to do to get to turn our inner geek on to do it, and I think it's fun. But I just want to make sure that we give you everything that you need. So does anybody have any questions for me before we move on? Chris, were there any that you saw? Uh, well, we haven't had any questions just yet. So while we wait for some questions to come in, if there are any, I'll let you remind them about tomorrow and Friday again. <laughs> okay, sounds good. So let everybody know. Tomorrow we have a completely free how to get your first cloud architect job webinar. People come all over the world to these things. We tell you how to leverage your past experience to get yourself your first cloud architect job. And we talk about how to show the hiring manager you actually have experience based upon what you've done in your past life. We talk about the actual job and how to become competent in that job. We talk about how to skip HR and have your resume seen by the hiring manager. We talk about what needs to be on your resume. And you know what else we talk about? How to become the hiring manager's dream hire. Because when you're what the hiring manager wants, they hire you and they'll pay you a lot more. So we give you all the tools on this completely for a webinar so you know how to get hired. And then on Friday, we're going to have a completely, completely, completely free interview practice session. We'll bring you in, we'll interview you, and we'll tell you what you need to do better. Or we'll tell you if you're ready. And by the end of that session, you'll know if you're ready to get cloud hired. So, Chris, I think I see one question from Danka GC. Is BGP exclusive? And she says, I mean, is the only protocol used all over the internet? Danica, well, let's talk about this. There are a lot of protocols that are used during the internet. Inside of an organization, all organizations, they will have their own interior gateway protocol, which means if you go to an internet service provider, they're going to be running OSPF or intermediate system to intermediate systems in that provider. Now, the next thing they will do is, inside of that, they will run eBGP to external providers, and they will also run iBGP across their network to take the roots that say somebody learned via Verizon to then pass them off on to say NTT. So in the internet, we're going to be in our internet service providers. They're going to be running an interior gateway protocol, which will be OSPF or intermediate systems to intermediate systems. In addition to that, they might be running MPLS, which is label switching or tag switching. They might also be using RSVP signaling to determine if enough bandwidth is there to create a pseudo wire across their network. So now there's a lot of routing protocols that we're going to be using, but it's always going to be BGP to connect one entity to another entity that's external. And we're always going to be using our own interior gateway protocols internally. But we might be routing on tags or labels via MPLS. We might be signaling tunnel creation via MPLS tunnels with something called resource reservation protocol. For example, if uh, T 
Chow's over there. Chow's fantastic. She's uh, one of my amazing students. Just got back from visiting her family in Vietnam, but she's really amazing and does amazing things each day. And what I mean by that is if I want to create a 10 gigabit pseudo wire between me and Chow over there, if the network can only support one gigabit, I can't create a 10 gigabit pseudo wire. I mean, I could, but it would only get one gigabit of bandwidth. So we also then could use signaling protocols such as resource reservation to say, to see and signal and reserve the 10 gigabytes that we need for the network. So there's lots of routing that we do on the internet. We do some software defined networking, which is the separation of the control plane and the data plane. So it's not the only protocol, but it's the only protocol that's used to connect entities to each other. So a company wants to connect to three internet service providers. They run BGP to Verizon. They run BGP to NTT. They run BGP to CenturyLink. They run BGP to uh, AT&T. They take in all the routes from all the providers, and then they determine the best path. But AT&T might be running uh, OSPF, whereas Verizon might be running, inter well, Verizon's probably running OSPF, and, and uh, NTT, or I'm sorry, CenturyLink is running intermediate systems to intermediate systems. So there's that. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Cloud hired, yes. Cloud hired, Denka. Millicent, you love GoCloud. Millicent, when you came to our program, it was such a wonderful experience. You came in, you joined us, you made an impact on everyone. But I got to tell you, that photo of you with the tiger, that's just, that you, that you use in Zoom, that's the best I've ever seen. Fantastic. What security does BGP use for connecting one entity to the other? Well, for one thing, Angelo, and that's a great question, I have to say that I want to connect you, Angelo, and I have to do it. Now, we can also use authentication, MD5 authentication, which is not the most the greatest thing, but we can use authentication forms to also determine that you are what you say you are. So we manually use it, and we've got authentication that we can use to authenticate the peer and the routing updates. Great question there, Angelo. Is BGP open source? BGP is specified by the Internet Engineering Task Force as an open protocol, so yes. Now, granted, Juniper on their devices and Cisco may also have some proprietary enhancements if you turn them on, but here's the thing. The thing is quite straight, quite, quite frankly this. BGP is an open standard, and that's why we use it. Because it works on Cisco routers and Juniper routers and Palo Alto firewalls and Fortinet firewalls. So BGP is very open source. It has been. In fact, anytime we're dealing with these things in the cloud, we have to use open source, especially when you want to use multi-cloud. Uh, there's different versions, Robert. There's always there's always a new iteration, uh, BGP 3, 4. Who knows? There'll be a BGP 5. It's just a matter of when. Uh, they're all almost the same, but with each feature or upgrade, you've got more functionality. So, so <laughs> generation two cell phone technology, generation three, generation four, generation five. It's just that kind of thing. It's a new version of the old thing. Chris, you want to bring in the next one? XBLMA. Why do architects need to know BGP? Well, XBLMA, you can't work as an architect if you don't know routing. What is the cloud? It's a network in a data center. How do you design servers to talk to each other? You need a network. Without a network, nothing talks to each other. So it can't be done without BGP. So if you don't know how to get your traffic from the data center to the cloud, nothing will happen. You must use BGP if you're going to use a private line to the cloud. And reality is if you don't know BGP and you don't know how to get the routing, your users and you won't be able to reach the cloud so again, they won't be able to do it. And, and when they can, what's going to happen is the routing will be wrong, which means your traffic won't get to its destination, which means your systems will crash. So architects need to know BGP because architects design. And when you design a network, you must know BGP. Same reason you need to know IP addressing. Same reason you need to know switching. Same reason you need to know NAT. Same reason you don't need VLANs, et cetera, et cetera. If you don't know what it is, you can't design it. You can configure things that you don't understand if you just know configuration commands, but you can't design what you don't know. And what do we do with cloud architects? We design and take things from the network in the data center to move it to the cloud, which is another network in a data center. So that means if you don't know networking 
and you're trying to put something into a network, you can't do it. So that's the reason architects need to know BGP. Everything we do is about networking and data center technology. Take a thousand virtual machines from the network, move them to the cloud. Take these 50,000 subnets and migrate some of them to the cloud. It's all the same. So we must know networking if we want to be a cloud architect. Deuce world, what makes a protocol BGP? Well, what makes a cat a cat? What makes a doctor a doctor? What makes a bear a bear? What makes a lawyer a lawyer? The protocol is BGP. There's a specification. You can see all the BGP specifications on the IETF.org page. Somebody writes a specification, and then all the vendors make a protocol that meets that specification. And it tells you how they should say hello to each other, how they should send the routes, the kind of messages that are between them. These are the critical, critical, critical kind of things that makes that there. But if a protocol is written as BGP, it'll be BGP. It's kind of like if you were a manufacturer. If you were going to make a car, you'd make it a car. If you were going to make it a truck, you'd make it a truck. So yeah, BGP is always used for, well, all routing protocols are used for high availability. And it will, it will permit failover if a physical interface is down. It will permit failure if lots of interfaces are down. It will reroute around it. So it's like your GPS IE that will get you to the ultimate destination. Great perspective. Who determines the best path? Well, BGP will determine it on its own. Unless you do traffic engineering, which we're going to do later today, Sebastian. And that is a fantastic question. Are they backwards compatible? Uh, they usually they usually negotiate back down. Good question there, John. BGP is a TCP-based unicast protocol. Unicast means it must be point-to-point. -point. A great question. Other routing protocols, Chino, are like, like OSPF, which says a hello on 224.0.0.5 and 224.0.0.6 for the DR, the DR routers, the backup DRs. So, you know, that's multicast. So that can be point to multicast point. But this is always going to be point to point because it's unicast. What is BGP dampening? That's a great question. So I want you to think about this. Let's imagine we've got a network. And we want it to scale. And how do we scale it? We reduce the calculations the network would do. So for example, if we're an internet service provider and we've got 8 million routes on our router, 800,000 from 10 entities. Now let's assume that one entity had a couple of bad networks and the routes were going up and down, up and down, and up and down, and up and down. Some of them were coming up and down. And it was so much that it could easily overwhelm all of our ability to calculate these 8 million routes. So by doing that, we can basically say if routes get a little ugly and they start to get a little cuckoo, just don't pay attention. So imagine you've got a child. And your child basically cries, they're unhappy. You fix it. But let's say the child's unhappy. You check they're not sick. They're not hungry. They've got their favorite toys. They've got their favorite clothes. They have everything they want and they're still crying and you just ignore them for five minutes and they get better? Well, kind of really what's going on, that's the same thing that's going on with BGP dampening. You're telling the routers, hey, we're getting a lot of noise, a lot of noise, a lot of noise. Don't pay attention to it for a few minutes and then see if it's still there. That's really what dampening is. It's designed to stop the influx in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. <clears throat> so kind of keep that in the back of your mind. We can see how far the, so let's get back to the content. There are other questions which we'll try and actually do, but we're gonna keep it to either networking or career things like containers or way outside of the scope of networking. We'd love to talk to you about them and we're happy to, but we've gotta keep it somewhat relevant. So now, Let's talk about how BGP forms a neighbor relationship. And as such, guess what? We're going to talk about a lot of states in something called the finite state machine. We're going to be talking about the idle state. 
the connect state, the active state, the open sent, open confirmed and established. And you know what you want to see when you're dealing with BGP? Established. If you, excuse me, see established, life is good. But let's talk about this. Idle. So as soon as I put router BGP, one, two, three, four, five, neighbor, one, two, three, four, remote AS, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or whatever. Uh, as soon as I do that, the routers are going to attempt to start a TCP connection or wait for a TCP connection. In that state, in that state, only then are we idle. Why are we idle? We are idle because of the following. We are idle because the TCP session hasn't been set. So if you configure BGP and you misconfigure BGP, guess what happens? You go back to idle because you won't form that relationship. Now let's talk about connect. So what is connect? Assuming both BGP speakers on both sides of the equation establish a TCP connection, we're now in connect state. And here's what happens. As soon as we establish that TCP session, what do we do? We send that open message that we talked about before. Open up. Let's form a neighbor relationship. So we start out as idle. We get to connect and we send an open message to our neighbor. Woohoo, things are working good. And if this occurs, we get in transition to open scent. And wow, this is good stuff. Now, let's pretend that doesn't happen. So we go. We establish our TCP connection, we send open and transition to open send. But if the TCP connection is not success successful, we gotta try and figure out how to create the TCP connection, right? And what's gonna happen is BGP is gonna continue to listen and it's gonna transition to the state called active. Active is not great, it's a transitional state. So all's good, we connect, TCP session, we send an open message and we go to open send. This is what we want. Now, if not, what ultimately happens is going to be as follows. We'll transition to active. And while we're in active, we're going to have a connect retry timer. And it's going to try and get us to keep sending, uh, keep connecting and establishing a TCP session. Now, if it does and we're good, we go to connect and then we send the open message and transition to open send. But if we can't for any other reason, we go back to idle. So Idle is the initial state, or if something bad happens. So idle is either the beginning or not good. If you just do BGP and you do show IP BGP neighbors, then it says idle. Yes, it's okay. But if it stays idle after a minute, you got a problem there. So it's a matter of knowing what's going on and when. Now, active. As I mentioned previously, when we go to connect and we send an open message and we go to open send, this is good stuff. But if it doesn't, we hit this active state. Now this, again, I wanna make sure it again because the active state really made it hard for me when I started with BGP 25 years ago. The active state is this transition state. It sort of waits and it either goes back to idle or it goes to open send. So either back or forward, and it's pretty much all based upon how fast that TCP session came up and whether that open sent, open message was sent and received. But let's say it all works well. Start out at aisle, then we go to connect, we send an open message and we transition to open send. This is what we want. Good news here, open send. So in this state, we've sent our open messages and when everybody receives the open message, we check all fields. And if an error word exists, we'd send a notification and kill the neighbor relationship. But if it's good, now we're here. Now, at this point, after the open message is sent, we're going to send keep alive. Hello, are you there? Hello, are you there? I'm here. You're here. I'm here. You're here. Let's have a conversation. And that's really the way BGP works. So we send the open. We send the keep alive. And we get the keep alive back. And now where do we go? 
Right now we're in open confirm and we're going to transition to established. Established is as good as it gets. That's the full handshake. I give the person routes. They give me routes. We're exchanging routing information and we are happy, happy campers. I give my routing information. I get my routing information. This is as good as it gets. And letting you know, I know we're all really geeky and academic here right now. But we're going to spend an hour or two doing whiteboard sessions. We'll walk it through. It'll be a chalk talk. That's where the fun comes. But I got to get a little geeky. That's where I brought my hat with the propellers on it today. Yeah, once we're in established, I'm all happy because that's when we send our routing information. So we're using BGP because it's so flexible and it's so tunable. That's why we use it. Scalability, tunability, flexibility, this stuff is great. And what enables us to do this are the attributes that BGP carries. So BGP carries a lot of attributes about certain routes and network layer reachability information. Cool, cool, cool stuff. We'll see the, the uh, path. And the path is going to... Uh, Determine how your routes got there, which autonomous systems. We'll be able to see things like a local preference of the weight and a weight. We'll be able to see the origin code of the route and all kinds of cool, 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 fun stuff. And those are our nerd knobs that we're going to play with. And they are really cool and they are really fun. And of course, that's the fun. That's the party time. That's the whiteboarded out. And that's the stuff that the cloud architects need to know. Because you've got two direct connections to the cloud. You don't want your traffic going out an AT&T direct connection and coming back on a Verizon one. You'll have out-of-order packets and your systems will fall apart. So we cloud architects need to know two links to how to load share across your links without blocking one. Heck, on the intro to in, on the AWS Advanced Networking, which is kind of like an intro to 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 an intro to, an intro to junior level networking, they tell you to just block one link because they don't assume you know how to do it. But guess what? Customers don't pay for links to not use them, and they want to use them. So kind of keep that back. Georgette, I'm so happy to see you here. Abigail Marks, I see you here with that blue wrench. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, thank you, uh, oh, everybody out there with the blue wrench, for helping out. I really do appreciate it. So now that we know this, now let's really talk about what we can do, because we're going to manipulate them inbound and outbound later. We're going to have fun with that. That's really the fun stuff. So. Just remember that these attributes talk about things. So let's talk about what our attributes are. Well, for one thing, there's an origin attribute. And uh, origin attribute, origin attribute. So that's how we learned the route. Did we learn the route? Because we redistributed it from OSPF into BGP, meaning we learned it from RGP. Did we learn it from an EGP like BGP? Or is the information incomplete? And you know what? We can tune this. We can create a route map and we can change the origin code to make a route more preferred or less preferred. One of those little nerd knobs we get to play with. Brandon, I would say the AWS advanced networking is like an intro to 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 a junior level version of a CCNA class. So Brandon, I think you could pass that without even reading the book. So the next BGP attribute we're talking about is the AS path. Now, what is the AS path? It's the autonomous systems or organizations that you have to cross to get to there. So for an example, Brandon Bowman's over there. He's over there in Georgia. Let's say he works for the Brandon Internet Service Provider. Brandon's a great guy. So Brandon owns Brandon's ISP. Now, Brandon's ISP is good friends with Abigail Marks' ISP, who is also a good friend with Chow's ISP. I think you all have uh, blue wrenches over there, Chow, Abigail. So here's what would happen. I connect to Brandon, right? Brandon has some routes that he learned from Abigail, but Brandon sends me the route. So let's say Abigail's autonomous system is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And Brandon's autonomous system is six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So what happens here is Brandon learns a route from one, two, three, four, five, and he then sends me the route. But Brandon is six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
So by the time I see a route, it's got an AS path or the path that it came through. One, two, three, four, five, and six, seven, eight, nine. So I know that I am two internet service provider hops away. So what do you think BGP prefers? The shorter number of internet service providers that it's got to hop through to the destination. So the AS path, generally speaking, the shorter the AS path, then we're preferred the route. But there's a decision tree, and it's the algorithm that determines how we do this, and we will have a party with that. The next attribute is the next hop. This one, this one is critical. This one over here, if you don't get this right, this will break everything. If the next hop is unavailable, the router won't put it in the routing table. So what do I mean by that? The next hop is 1.2.3.4. If I can't reach 1.2.3.4, every route that Brandon told me is thrown away. To the next top attribute. So which attributes did we talk about so far? We talked about the origin attribute, which is how we learned it. We talked about the path attribute, which is the which number of, I, what are the ISPs we came through? And we talked about the next top attribute. Now this one, this was the easiest way to manipulate the outbound traffic on Cisco routers. And this was very Cisco proprietary. Other organizations are now supporting weight because the patent ran out. Weight is locally specific to the router. Generally speaking, the greater the weight, the more preferred the outbound traffic goes. The greater the weight, the more preferred the outbound traffic goes. So now, let's talk about the path selection process. You get this, you know BGP. So what is it? If the next top is not reachable, don't put it in the routing table. So what do we know? The next top has to be reachable. Two, prefer the path with the highest weight. Next, if your weights are equal, prefer the path with the highest local preference. So highest weight, highest local preference. If the local preferences are the same, prefer the route that was originally lo lo that was originated locally on the router, meaning one that you did because it's more reliable. Now, if the local preference is the same and no route was lo lo locally originated, prefer the route with the shortest AS path. Now, if the AS path is the same, prefer the path with the lowest origin code, meaning the IGP is lower than the EGP, which is also lower than incomplete. So now, if our origin codes are complete, we're gonna prefer the path with the lowest MED otherwise known as multi-exit discriminator, meaning exiting our autonomous system. And of course, if the meds are the same, we're going to prefer an eBGP route over an IBGP route. But yeah, okay. And then we now we're starting to get into the simple nonsense because we've got to have a winner. If the routes are still equal, prefer the route with the shortest path to the next hop. And then if the routes are still equal, prefer the path that was received first. This makes you more stable because you're not fluttering back and forth, kind of like BGP dampening. And then, if the routes are still equal, prefer the route advertised from the neighbor with the lowest IP address. Like I said, this is where it gets ridiculous because you've got to have an election winner and you've got to have something. So, I'll hold this path, that kind of thing. So, now you know the BGP decision tree. I'm going to go over it one more time. Choose the path with the highest weight. If the weights are the same, choose the path with the highest local preference. If that's the same, Choose the route that the local router originated. If that's the one, choose the one with the shortest AS path. If that's all the same, use the lowest origin code, IGP, EGP versus incomplete. If they're all the same, choose the path with the lowest multi-exit discriminator. Then prefer EBGP over IBGP. Then take the oldest route and then one the one with the lowest router ID, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is why it matters. So know all of these things that matters. So now we're going to get into the coolness and the fun. But before we do, if you're having a good time, if you can hit the like, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell, tell some friends to join us and type hashtag cloud hired. Because it's all for us about knowing that you're all getting hired. That's why we do everything that we do. 
Let's take some questions and then we're going to break out into the party time. This is where the fun's going to be. Chris, if you want to go through and check and see what kind of questions exist before we get to the next phase. AS path is the number of hops. So the shorter the, the, the shorter the AS path, the less number of hops. Absolutely, Mandar. Excellent, excellent, excellent. What kind of hardware do we have dedicated to our EVENG server? To become a BGP god like you, is it worth buying a server for EVNG or is it cheaper to sign up and terminate EVNG in the Google Cloud? Well, generally speaking, Eugene, I build my own EVENG server. I find it much cheaper for me to do the things on my servers and use the cloud. I did spec out running our business on the cloud. We have 10 24 core servers, Eugene, that each have 128 gigs of RAM. Amazon wanted $11,000 per month for the cloud. Uh, we were able to build it for $10,200 one time and never have to pay for it again, as opposed to that almost $400,000 that AWS wanted for our service. And, and Google was about on the same price. So, you know, it's up to that. So it's a matter of what you need to do and when you need to use it and what your use case is like. So I use these servers. I use... Uh, Dell 7910 workstations um, because they have dual Xeon CPUs. Each one has two 12-core CPUs in them. Some of mine have more bigger CPUs. The least amount of DRAM I have in any one of my servers is 120 gigs. Most have 256. And I typically use uh, an NVMe drive in these things, but you could use a couple of SSD drives in RAID 0. Probably going to be cheaper just to buy the server, use the server, and keep it because when you're doing some of these things, you're going to need a lot of memory in the CPU cores. And that's when your cloud servers get expensive. Plus, I'm going to tell you this, that to set that server up, Eugene, it was not fun. It took a couple of hours to do it. So it's not something you're going to build on the fly and then tear down on the fly. Percent, why is BGP used over the internet? Because it's an open standard? Because it's the only routing protocol that can handle the kind of routes that the internet has. It's the only thing. All the interior gateway protocols will die around five, ten thousand routes, and the internet has about eight hundred thousand routes, and we need to get that from ten different plus service providers in internet routing. So that's the only routing protocol we can use. One sec, one second. Mandar weight was applicable only on Cisco routers. But it now works on Juniper routers. It also works on AWS and other cloud providers as well. It was only good for Cisco, but it became more of an open standard than the proprietary it was many years ago. You understand the algorithms, MED, preference, and so on. Well, we're going to walk through that and verify that. But you want to understand how these values are physically set. Who sets them? The network engineers do this. Absolutely. And on the AWS cloud, the cloud engineer might be doing this. So on, the, on your side, it'll be a network engineer on the data center side. But on the cloud, it could be a cloud engineer. And, and this is pretty standard. So look at it this way. The cloud architect is going to be the one that decides the traffic pattern or the network architect. But it's the network engineer that configures the routers that configures the, the BGP part, that puts the IP addressing thing, that determines the router ID, that configures the BGP peering sessions, the route maps, et cetera, the distribute list and all of that. That's all the network engineers. The engineers always are the ones doing the setting. Always, always, always. Is this root choosing automatically? Yes, Martin, what's gonna happen is you're gonna receive all this information and it's going to be processed by that decision algorithm, and the routes will always be there and chosen automatically. Absolutely. But we can tune these attributes. Okay, so why do we need an IGP? So if you're going to detect a router to a router, they have to be able to reach each other. And if you don't have an interior gateway protocol, you won't be able to have your routers reach each other. 
So let's say we've learned a million routes via BGP. We can't put those million routes into OSPF inside of our network. Our network can't handle it. So we need to use BGP to, to keep the routes and use IBGP to push them on our network. Now, if you've got a router on one side that has to connect to a router on another side via BGP, and you don't have network layer reachability, you won't even be able to connect the connections. So the interior gateway protocol is to provide network layer reachability for BGP to be able to do its magic, but it won't work without an IGP, which is really funny. Somebody wanted me to write a, a book on, on Google Cloud networking, and they said BGP is the only routing protocol, and I said, not exactly. And they said, but you only use BGP, and I said, show me how you make BGP work without, I, without an IGP. And they said, I've never set up BGP before. And I said, yeah, then you should not be writing a Google Cloud networking book, and I don't want to write it with you. But really, that's the key. Um, and you're new, so it's great. That's why we're doing these kind of things. We need the interior gateway protocol. So if I want to form a BGP pairing session with Abigail Marks over there, I need to be able to reach Abigail Marks to be able to do it because TCP uses what? BGP uses what? TCP part 179. So Abigail Marks is two hops away. And I don't have an IGP. I can't reach her. I can't reach her. And that's the reason why. The routes are determined what's in the router's routing table. And the BGP table, Ruth, absolutely will be one of the things that populates the routing table. Now, the interior gateway protocol will also populate the routing table. But the BGP table will be based on BGP learned routes. And the table, and we'll have lots of fun with that, Ruth, will be determining who the path is. And we'll have fun with that in just a few minutes. Can I whiteboard the connectivity between the core routers? Yeah, we're going to absolutely do that, Mandar. Absolutely. Yes, we need inter, in order to use the inner in order to use send any routing information to anybody that's not ourselves. We have to use BGP, whether it be a cloud provider or internet service provider. Absolutely. OSPF or intermediate systems to intermediate systems, which is best for large scale networks. Well, I'd like you to look at it this way. Intermediate systems to intermediate systems isn't even an IP routing protocol. It was designed for CLNS routing long before IP actually existed. Now, with intermediate to intermediate systems, what work, what's so good about this is it works well with a very large flat network, so where everything's just a level one route. So intermediate systems to intermediate systems scales really well in a flat environment, non-hierarchical. So organizations that are running MPLS often use intermediate systems to intermediate systems because it enables them to have a single flat network where the link state advertisements carry a lot of data. So there are two or three major service providers throughout the world that are using intermediate systems to intermediate systems. CenturyLink was one of them. They were the old level three communications, but there are a few others. OSPF is generally what most people use. And it is a fantastic routing protocol that was designed for IP. And it initially had the type 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 LSAs. They added the type 7 LSAs that were there for the not so stubby areas. And they've recently added multiple additional LSAs to carry MPLS based information. I've worked with both. I prefer to work with OSPF, but I will work with either. And a good network architect know, needs to know how to work with both and deal with both because they're the two interior gateway protocols that we use for everything. But if you were going to go tell, ask me in, 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 in enterprises, I would tell you 90 plus percent of them are all OSPF and intermediate systems to intermediate systems is only with a very small number of organizations. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Not better, they're just different. Chris, I think we have one or two more. Sean Polanis. IGP is not BGP, and IGP is an interior gateway protocol such as EIGRP, OSPF, or intermediate systems to intermediate systems. IBGP is interior BGP, and EBGP is external BGP. So IBGP connects to the same autonomous system, Sean. EBGP would be connecting to 
an external, an external autonomous system. Deuce, you can't do these things without BGP. So if you don't know BGP, pretty much you can't connect to a cloud provider. You can't connect to multiple internet service providers and load share. So the only time people would not use BGP is if they didn't understand BGP. And if they don't understand BGP, they basically have to make some major trade-offs. For example, you can't use two internet service providers at one time if you don't know BGP. You can't uh, connect... Uh, you can't load share across direct connections to the cloud provider. So pretty much, if you want to do anything real, you're going to have to use BGP. Let's get back to the content, and we're going to start to have some fun. So the first thing I want to do before we get into traffic engineering or the tuning is I want to answer Mandar's question, as well as Sean's question. IBGP versus EBGP, IGPs, etc. So let's draw it out. We'll do as I'll, I'll draw this out. We'll have a little bit of whiteboarding fun. I always like whiteboarding fun. Let me come over here and okay. So right now we've got a whiteboard over here. My version of a whiteboard, it's Microsoft PowerPoint. So let's, let's look at what most organizations do. So let's create an environment. And in our ISP, we have a router here, a router here, a router here, a router here. Let's say this is our ISP. Let's add some links in between their devices. Let's create a reliable environment for them. Got some links between our devices. Okay, we're over here, we're over here. Let's add some links over here and over here. So now let's, let's make this A, let's make this B, let's make this C, let's make this D. Now we've got a basic internet service provider. Now, inside of this internet service provider, these routers are communicating with each other. Do you think it would be important, tell me in the chat box, if a link between A and B were to fail, that we could reroute around it quickly? Or do you think we can wait 10 minutes for this to happen? Inside of our entity, do we need it to be fast, fast, fast? So because we need A to be able to reach D or B as fast as possible, we need a protocol that's designed to give us speed. Which protocols are designed to give us speed? Interior gateway protocols that are designed for speed or exterior gateway protocols that are designed for scalability? Speed versus scalability. This link goes away, I wanna reroute around it. This link goes away, I wanna know about it in seconds, not minutes. So we run an IGP. Now let's build a couple different internet service providers over here. Build another internet service provider. Now let's build another internet service provider. So now we've got three ISPs. They're all running an interior gateway protocol internally for network layer reachability information. Now what's going to happen? What we're going to have is we're going to have eBGP peering between these organizations. So this is going to be EBGP, EBGP. Now, also, guess what? We're going to, in between this ISP and this ISP, what else are we going to do? Again, we're going to go back to EBGP. So we're going to go back to here. We're going to go to the shapes. We're going to go click this. Again, this is going to be EBGP. Let's pop this over here. This is going to be EBGP. Now, I want you to really think about this. We learn a route. Let's call this route A. Let's, uh, let's pop in a subnet over here. 
We just learned about this subnet 1.0.0.0 slash 8. This route comes from here. This route is then sent to this BGP speaker here. This route has to go through this organization to someone else. And that's where IBGP comes in. So what's going to happen is we're going to use IBGP inside of this organization, which is going to ride on top of the IGP, the but IBGP over here. So now when we learn about this one route, it gets carried across their network via IBGP and then sent to the next entity via EBGP. And now here's what it looks like. Let's call this two. Let's call it three. Now, when we get this 1.0.0 route, what's it going to look like? It's going to have this AS path. It's going to be the prefix. It's going to give us an AS path. And the AS path, what's that going to be? It's going to be three comma two. Now the route, route will have a weight. It might say be three, two, seven, six, eight. It'll have a local preference, which is going to be a hundred by default. Now that's what we're going to see over here. That's the path. Likewise, we have to run IBGP to carry it over because if this guy speaks BGP over here or girl, whatever you want to call him, how's this person going to reach this one? They can't because they have to cross this network. So we're running eBGP to connect to externals and we're running IBGP to carry those external routes across our network. That's the point of eBGP. But we don't have the ability to do a BGP pairing session between A and B as a general rule with IBGP, unless we have a, have a loopback. So I want you to think about this. If we just did BGP over the physical interface between B and A, and this link goes down, we don't have a BGP pairing session. But if we have an interior gateway protocol running and we connect the loopback or logical address to this router, and the loopback address on this router, and this link goes away, it doesn't matter because we can reach it this way. And if this link goes away, it doesn't matter, we can reach it this way. And if this link goes away, well, we're in trouble. But see, we've got three, we've got triple redundancy that's here, and we don't have that without the interior gateway protocol. So the interior gateway protocols are designed to kind of self-heal your network. So I hope that makes sense why we're using an eBGP and IBGP and all this other stuff. If we don't have this, we're in trouble. IGP internally, because it gives us robustness. As I showed you here, if you wanted to hit a logical address on this and a logical address on this, the kind of address that doesn't go down if you lose a port or a link or a cable, when you have that, now you're in some really, really, really good state. You know, exciting, exciting stuff. So that's why we do it. We've got the IGP to give us speed, IBGP to carry the routes off through our autonomous system, and EBGP to connect to external entities. If that makes sense, everybody type hashtag BGP. I mean, then I know you're good, and then I'm going to get involved in the fun stuff. And while I'm writing it to type hashtag BGP, while we're at it, so with that. So Amanda, yes, inside of an autonomous system, we're going to have an IGP and IBGP. Yes, 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 you guys got it. I'm loving it. So now we've talked about this. We've talked about EBGP. We've talked about IBGP. Woohoo! now's the fun time. Let's have some fun. I'm going to walk you through some things that I've pre-made and done for you. And then after this, this is when the party times, BGP party time. So let's have some fun with it. So yeah, this is exactly what happened to Facebook. Somebody didn't know it well enough and misconfigured something. We don't We want to misconfigure things. We want to be experts at what we do. And that's why we're there. And you can see without these fundamentals, lots of things break. It's really funny. I'm a martial artist and have been before we get back to the content. You know, when I practice martial arts, I studied the Israeli style mostly. 
everything was simple and basic, and it was master it, master it, master it. And I remember doing the same thing all day, every day, again and again and again until I got it perfect. And then I remember training with somebody, and this person just wanted to learn this, 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 and this. But they didn't know anything in depth. So get there deep, 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 and we're really good. We'll get you nice and solid. So keep that in the back of your mind. So let's walk through a couple of traffic engineering experiences and let you let you guys walk through it. So let's let's go to an environment. By, let's do basic routing for traffic engineering. So I want you to think about this. Routers prefer the most specific path. Routers prefer the most specific path. That's not even BGP, that's routers in general. So if I've got a route to 192.168.1.0 slash 24, and I have a route to 192.168.1.0 slash 30, I am going to take the 192.168.1.0 slash 30 because it's a lot more specific. It specifies a subnet that's got four total addresses versus the slash 24, which is a subnet that's got 254 total addresses. So keep that in the back of your mind. There's like that. So when we're involved in these things, we take the most specific route. So let's say you've got two links and you want to load share. Well, let's look at this simple, elegant solution. In the, the site arrange for the data center that we're dealing with in this particular environment, whoops, that was not what I was trying to do. The site arrange that we're talking about is 172.16. Dot zero dot zero slash 15. That is our CIDR range. So let's think about that. Inside of that CIDR range, we might have a subnet 172.16.0.0 slash 16. And we probably also have a subnet 172.17.0.0 slash 16. So let's think about this. What if on the top link, we advertised 172.16 slash 16? And on the bottom link, we advertise 172.17. Well, what's the most specific route? The most specific route is as follows. 172.16 on the top link. So you know what data is going to be sent on the top link? 172.16. Do you know what data will be sent on the bottom link? The most specific route. What is that? 172.17.0.0. slash So that's it. Top link, specific link. Bottom link specifically. Why then did I put a 172.16 slash 15? Let's think about this right now, everybody. If I take this beautiful, beautiful system that I have right now and I get rid of this top link, it's dead. And I don't have this summary address, 172.16.0.0.15. All I have is the 172.17. So now, who reaches the cloud? We can reach 172.17.0.0.16 because we have it in our routing table. But if that's the only route, can we reach 172.16? No, we can't. Now, if I put 172.16.0.0 slash 16 on the bottom link, I could. But if I did that, I wouldn't be load sharing. So what I would do is I would take a summary route that's good for both side ranges and stick it on both the top link and the bottom link and leak a more specific route on the top link and the bottom link. And by doing that, the more specific traffic is sent on one link, the bottom link, the more specific traffic is sent on the top link. And everything works perfectly. Now, if either one of those two cables gets cut or the router dies, guess what? Because we have that summary link, we will reroute the traffic to the next one. So one of the easiest ways to do this without the simplest form of traffic engineering, specific route on one subnet, specific route on another subnet, poof, Bob's your uncle and everything works in your load sharing without out of order packets. Keep that in the back of your mind. That's why we do what we do in so many ways. Let's walk through another situation. Over here. Now, when we're dealing with BGP, we've got to do this in both directions. But if I pop both directions, these charts are going to get really ugly. So now let's say we want to use the top link to uh, the data center. We want to use the top link for 172.16. And we want to use the bottom link for 172.16. Well, can we do anything about it? Yeah, we can. 
What if we change the weight for the top length for, for the 172.16? And we raise the weight for the 172.17. Hmm. Prefer the path with the largest weight. Okay. By using a greater weight on the bottom one for 172.17, that becomes the preferred path, right? Right? We love that, right? So kind of keep that on the top link. We've raised the weight for 172.16. Guess what? We've found more preferred, better paths. Do we like that? Everybody, do we like that? Higher weight. Prefer the path with a higher weight. We've traffic engineered our traffic. Local preference. Prefer the path with the largest local preference. Hmm. So we've raised the local preference to 172.16.0.0, right? We've raised the local preference to 172.17.0.0. Which link is going to be used for 172.16? The top one. Why? It's got the higher local preference. Which link is going to be used for 172.17? The bottom link, because it's got the 200 local preference. Okay. Now, if the bottom link goes away completely, can we still reach the two subnets? Sure. Can. We've got a route to both of them. So as you can see here, what we're doing is we're building a path and building a backup path. And we're determining which path we want to use. Let's prepend the AS path. Remember when I talked, when, when, I, when I took you over here and I showed you the path of the route that we learned has the AS autonomous systems that it transpired. So let's go back to here. Let's look at it this way. In this particular situation, what we have over here is we have the AS path of 64523. That's the autonomous system that we're learning our routes from. All good, right? So the 17216 has an AS path of 64523. What if I wanted to send the 17217 on the bottom link? Well, what I could do is I could make my 172.16 on the top link, and it says 176, but it should be 172. I'm gonna, for this 172.16 link, or 17 link that I have on the bottom, or on the, or over here, well, this would be 172.17. Notice what I did. I added or prepended an additional AS path. I manually put that there. As such, this is two ISP hops away, versus the top link is only one ISP hop away. So by doing it that way, I did the same thing on the bottom. I took the 172.17, made it as a primary. And I took the 172.16 and I made it as backup. How did I make it a backup? I made it look ugly. How did I make it look ugly? I prepended or added extra AS paths. And all these things should be 172. I knew there was something wrong with this slide while I was looking at it. What about modifying the meta, the multi exit discriminator, the cost to leave? Lowest met, right? So I wanted on the top link the 172.16 to be exciting. So I reduced the meta on that. I wanted the 172.17 to be less exciting. I, I raised the meta on that on the top link. Why? Now we're going to take 172 on the top link. How about on the bottom link? What are we going to take? Come on, tell me. Which one are we going to take? We're going to take the 172.17 because it has the lowest med. So I walked you through some examples. So let's play with it. Let's tune it out. This is the time for all of you guys. So every one of you, type Hashtag cloud hired, and now we're going to get into the cool nitty gritty of all this stuff. Unless, Chris, before I do that, did I miss any questions on the way to the whiteboard session? I'm going to put some on the screen. I'm, I'm not sure if you discussed them. All this goes over my head, so... <laughs> So Mandar, you know, it's interesting. Uh, years ago, some people used ERGRP, but realistically speaking, uh, ERGRP would work, intermediate systems to me, intermediate systems would work, LSPF would work. RIP is pretty dangerous as a routing protocol. It used hop counts. It had nothing to do with the cost of links. The way RIP worked, it was kind of like, best way I can describe it, when we were younger and we all played the game uh, Whisper Down the Lane, I tell you something you tell. So here's Rip. Hey, Mander, these are the routes I know. And you tell Chris, these are the routes you know. 
And Chris tells Gene these are the Raltinos, who tells Saeed, who tells Brian, who tells Robert, who tells Queen, who tells Cafe Memories, who tells Elvis. So RIP is not real reliable. EIGRP was a relatively good routing protocol, highly reliable, but internet service providers didn't use it, and here's the reason. You could only use it with Cisco routers, nobody else's. And because of that, when you couldn't see it with anybody else's routers other than Cisco routers, we couldn't use it. So for the, IG, for the IGP, realistically speaking, it's going to be OSPF in 99% of the cases, Mandar. And unless you're working with a really big internet service provider, they won't be using intermediate systems to intermediate systems because they either won't know about it. In most cases, they will not. They've never touched it. Majority of network engineers have never even heard of it unless they're working on big internet service provider environments, in which case they will be using it. But OSPF is typically what you can do. But any IGP could work. But the IGPs that we use in today's world are intermediate systems, intermediate systems, and OSPF. So pretty much the, they're all we would use. But any of them could work. Routers always pick the most specific paths. Yes. CJ. Good question. Oh, I'm so happy, Mandar. Perfect. All right, and that was all that we, we had. Okay, to pop up. so let's have some tuning time. Tuning, tuning, tuning. We're going to. Chris, did you ever get us any Jeopardy music? Or do I have to be Mr. Jeopardy? Uh, you have to be my, Mr. Jeopardy. I, okay. I, don't, I, don't, I don't feel like having to deal with uh, CBS or whoever's in charge of that. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. there we'll, we go. We'll, we'll find something better. <laughs> but, I'll um, be the Jeopardy music person. It's yeah. all about having fun for me. I love tech. So let's think about this. We talked about an algorithm. Let's just play with it a little bit. So you got over here, you got a router. Could draw the router a little prettier. You got a router and a router. Okay. Let's pop them, pop them in a little box, which of course will make this whole thing invisible until I kill the fill. No fill. Let's see if I can stop my phone from beeping. My phone that, that, was, that was my same message. Two minutes I know ago. it was yours. I was just trying yeah. to. <laughs> you, you, you had the two minute ding just, just like I do. If you don't read it after two minutes, it dings at you again. Oh, that's why it does that. Yep, I'll show you how to take care of that. That sounds great. After I get my coffee, I'll be back. <laughs> okay, so here we've got an ISP. Uh, let's say this is our data center. We'll do multi-cloud stuff soon, too. All good, right? So we've got our data center, and now we've got a cloud provider. And guess what that looks like? The same thing. Why? The cloud is nothing more than a network and a data center that's been virtualized. The cloud providers have just been really good. Elastic Compute Cloud, virtual machine. DynamoDB, no SQL database. I mean, seriously, who would even think about the name of these things? Amazon Simple Storage Solution, object storage. But, you know, it's just a, it's just a network and a data center. So let's say you've got two WAN connections to a cloud. Direct interconnection on Google, express route on Azure, and direct connection. To me, it's just a private line. But well, let's say you've got two links over here. Private line here, private line. It could be a VPN tunnel. It doesn't really matter. You can still use BGP and you shouldn't. Now you're learning this route. Let's say our CIDR range is that's our range. Let's say the subnets that we're actually using are as follows. N dot one dot zero dot zero slash sixteen and ten dot zero dot zero dot zero slash sixteen. Okay, so let's say we have these two routes. Let's say that I put 10 dot, let's just say that. If I put this on both links as it stands right now, 
Just the 10 dot one. Somebody tell me which is the preferred path. You don't have enough information to answer the question. So here's the thing. The prefix is the same. You have no information about the local preference, the AS path, et cetera, or the weight. Now, because we haven't done anything, the, let's assume the AS path. Let's give this, uh, this data, let's give this data center an autonomous system number of oops, 65535. So let's give you some more information. The AS path on this one is this. And guess what? The AS path on the bottom one is this. Which is picked? Anybody know? Well, we, we don't know the, the AS paths are the same. What about the weights? If the weights are the same and the local preferences are the same, next, we get to the origin code. What if the origin code is the same? If the origin code is the same, then uh, we start getting into crazy things like IP address on the router. So do we think we want to leave that to chance? No. We want to tune it. So let's say we wanted to take the 10.0.0 on the top link and the 10.1.0 on the bottom link. What would be the easiest way to load share over here? Do I, if I just put a specific link route on the top and a specific route on the bottom, will we be load sharing? Comment in the section below. And also, in this environment, if I have a cable cut, will it work? Again, comment that in the, in the section in the, in the chat box. In this particular environment, which would be the preferred path with the information you have there? If you can tell me, great. If not, say, tell me, wait, wait. Which link would be the preferred path for which subnet? And tell me what happens if either one of those links falls. That's what I want to know. Which path gets preferred for which subnet? And what happens if either one of those links goes down to the links that are advertised on that subnet? Let me know in the chat box. I'll do the Jeopardy music. Do, 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 we have any answers here? Okay, um, Mandar, the specific route, yes. So on the top link, we'll be pushing the 10.0.0 slash 16. And on the bottom link, we'll be picking the 10.1.0.0. Good job, Mandar, you're one of my students. That's why you know. Now, also Mandar, if the cable cut, we get a cable cut, it won't work. So Mandar, what or everybody else out there, what do we need to do to make it work in the, in the event we have a cable cut? Any ideas? Any ideas, anybody? Cable cuts happen, so what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? Now we can work around this. Well, Sean, you said no load sharing. So we could put a summary route, exactly. That would be one of the things. We can't do a default route um, because we might have a default route that goes to the internet and we need a specific route there to buy us. But what we probably can do is we can leak a more specific route or a, a general route. So what we could do, option one, which Mandar told us, this is good. We can do a 10.0.0.0 slash 15 on the top link, which of course will have the same AS path. This will work, Mandar, you are completely correct. And on the bottom link, we can also do, we can also pop this in there and we've got a completely good path. So Mandar, you are correct. That will completely work. What else could we do? What else what could we do? What if we did this? 10.0.0.0 slash 16 and 10.1.0.0 slash 16. Well, could we uh, change the weight?
okay, everybody, in this particular environment, which path is going to be chosen for which subnode? As soon as it's completed. In this particular environment, we'll get the we'll get the uh, we'll get the Jeopardy music out. Which link is going to be used for which subnet under normal circumstances after I fix my spell my spelling error? Do 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 pum pa dum pum 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 pum. Okay, who do we got? So which path is going to be preferred for the 10.0.0 slash 16? And which path will be used for the 10.1.0 slash 16? And if we've got a cable cut now, do we have complete and total network layer reachability? Robert, highest weight. So which is the highest weight there, Robert, for 10.0.0.0? And Ruth? Ruth, which is the highest weight for 10.1.0.0? Tell me the links like you got it, and I know you've got it. Okay, the higher weight will take yes, 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 exactly. So now let's get a little, let's let's think about this. Let's play a little more because we get we, we might have other attributes. So let's say we've got this, and let's say the local preference of this is 200. And over here, We've got the local preference of 200. While we're at it, this default local preference is 100. Is 200 bigger than 100? So changing the local preference to 200 could help, right? So everybody, what is the decision algorithm? Prefer the path with the highest weight. Prefer the path with the highest local preference. Weight comes first. Weight comes first. So now, in this particular environment, which link is used for 10.0.0.16? And which link is used for 10.0.1? Did playing games with the local preference make anything? Or, since weight is more important than local preference, we're going to choose the path with the highest weight anyway. Tell me in the chat box. I'll get the Jeopardy music out. Do 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 Come on, Ruth. Or oh wait, you already answered it, Ruth. You put thirty-five thousand for the top. Yes, that's the path that's going to be used because weight is more important than local preference. And that's why 10.0.0 excellent Sayid is used at the top and 10.1 is used on the bottom link. Excellent, excellent, excellent job. Okay, this is the kind of thing that I like to see because this means you're getting it exactly the higher the weight. Now, let's assume we wanted to do this, this. We could do it another way. We could do AS, path. Now let's change this AS path. So let's say this is 65535. That's its autonomous system. And now let's say we want to do it a little different. We want to prepend the AS path. Let's add a couple more 65535s here. We can do this called AS path prepend, and it's an attribute you can tune in BGP. So now let's go over here. Let's make this this. Change this path to this. Okay, guess what? We've modified another parameter. You guys are doing great. Deuce World, yes. Weight is greater than local preference, which is greater than AS path. Okay, so now, in this particular environment, we've got one that's one, one root that's one AS hop away. We have another root that's three AS hop away. So, what are we going to do? Which path are we going to choose? Do 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 do
Which link is 10.1.0.0 and why? Somebody fill that in in the chat box. The top has the path for the 10.0.16. Why? Because it's got a longer, it's got a shorter AS path. Exactly there, Ruth. Ruth, you're doing really great. Mark the top link. So I absolutely love that. You guys are getting it. You guys are doing fantastic. So we're talking about AF path prepending. We're talking about changing weights. We're talking about changing the local preferences. I'm liking this. You guys are doing great. So now let's try to really think about what we can do. So BGP has this concept of, so we can influence our outbound traffic very easily. How do we do it? Do the following. We can change the weight, the local preference, the article. It's so easy for us to do. That is outbound traffic leaving our entity. Now inbound traffic. Well, we could leak a more specific route to our service provider. We can prepend the routes that we send going out to influence traffic coming into us. But what else can we do? BGP has this concept of a community. So let's talk about BGP tuning and parameters. So let's assume that we have this. And there's lots of communities. And let's say that over here, we've got our, 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 let's just say our data center. And let's say over here, we've got a cloud. Same thing, data center, cloud. So what was I going to go over again? I'm, I'm not sure, Mike. Okay, I started, thought I started to talk about something and then I uh, lost my train of thought there for a second. Maybe they can help us in the chat box. Yeah, somebody help me in the chat box. What I was thinking about I, that I was talking about her over a minute ago because there was something I really, really, really wanted to be able to help her. In case anybody's wondering what it's like to work with on my, with Mike on a daily basis, Mike and I do this quite often. Yeah, great. either <laughs> either he has either he's got an idea, or I got an idea, or somebody's got an idea, and we we're just like, well, all right. So thank you, Ruth, about. for paying attention. We're talking about BGP communities. Okay, excellent. Oh, so what we actually can do is let's say we want to send a routing information. I can, I can actually tag the route. Let's say I tag the route red. I can build a community. I can name it anything one. I can call the, the tagged route red. What I can actually do on the far end is I can create a policy. And the policy might say match red, change weight. Or it could say, don't send my, don't export, which means don't take in the routes that you learn and give it to someone else. So we can do that with the community. We can basically match something, match a subnet, match a prefix, match a community, and then take an action. So that's what we do. And thank you so much, Ruth. What we're doing is we're taking something, we're tagging at it, and then we're matching a tag. So that's just what we were talking about on community. Now there's some well-known communities. One of them is called no export. And guess what? The cloud providers support it. What does the no export community mean? What it means is this. You connect to a, a cloud. And the cloud then connects to another cloud or the internet. But the no export community means is if you send your data to them, if it's no export, they won't send your routing information to anybody else. It'll stop here. As opposed to normally with eBGP, the routes would be passed from you to your cloud provider to the next cloud provider, internet service provider. With the community, we can tag it no export. And that means that when the cloud learns the cloud, it won't do it. So why might we want to do that? So let's say this is us. Let's say this is an ISPA. This is us. And this is ISPB. Now, if we take in the routes from ISPA and we pass ISPA's routes to ISPB, and then we take in the routes from ISPB, and then we take them in and then we send them to ISPA. Now, 
what's going to happen? Potentially, if we're not careful and we really don't know, we can have the entire internet go through our organization to reach certain subnets. Now, I've got to tell you, that is not what you want to do. Because what might happen is you might be pushing 100 terabytes of the internet traffic through your network that only has a gigabit connection. You've just taken down half of the entire internet. That's why we talk about the community no export. That's why when you connect to AWS, they assume you know nothing of networking, none. And that's why they turn everything into non-transitive routing. So IBGP is transitive and EBGP is transitive. So what does that mean? If ISPA over here tells me about the routes and I tell ISPB, ISPA and B can talk to each other through me. If I don't want ISPB to talk to each other through me, I can't take ISPB's routes and give it to ISPA and ISPA to give it to ISPB uh, for those same reasons. Kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So a BGP community is specifically in something that you can add to it. So it's kind of like, let's say I had two sets of students and I wanted them to compete. I could put red t-shirts on some of them and blue t-shirts and say red's competing with blue for the rest of the day. Same kind of concept. Tag something blue, blue's allowed in. Blue has a higher wave. Blue has a higher local preference. Drop blue, or whatever we wanna do. That's what we're dealing with the community. So the community is just something that you can do to tag stuff and, and then you can match that tag to do things. So that's some of what we do in the network architecture sort of percentage of the world. So let's talk about eBGP and iBGP a little bit. So eBGP is when we connect to external entities and iBGP is what we use in our own network. So this is kind of fun stuff. So eBGP is transitive. iBGP is non-transitive. This means that if we've got the following, let's say we've got these three devices in an iBGP environment. I want you to understand this. If Let's say this is IBGP. So let's say this is our router one, router two, router B, router C. So in EBGP, here's what's gonna happen. This character forms a neighbor adjacency with this one. This one forms a neighbor adjacency with this one. Router A tells C, router C about its route, who tells re router B about its route. Router B then reaches router A through C. Everything works. And if this is our goal, this is perfect. Perfect. This is the way eBGP works by default. Now, iBGP is different. In iBGP, if router A sends its routes to router C, router C won't tell router B about it. Hmm. That's ugly. Router A tells router C, but router C doesn't tell about B. Now router B tells router C about its routes, but router C can't tell A. This is IBGP. Now, does router B know about any of our router A's routes? No, because router A tells C who does not tell B. Router B tells C who does not tell A, so they can't reach each other. Because they can't reach each other, A can't reach C. This is called non-transitive routing. Now, how do we get around this? Well, if we add an IBGP connection between them, even if it's across the network, because we have a routing protocol for the IP, IBGP reachability from our IGP, now router B can tell router A of its routes. So what did we have to do? We have to, in an IBGP environment, in an IBGP environment, what do we have to do? See, look, let's go through this again because I don't think I was sharing my screen before. In this environment, router A tells its route to router C, but router C doesn't tell router B. Router B has routes. It tells router C, but router C doesn't tell router A. So router A can't reach router B because they have no idea of the routes. That's not good, right? Well, maybe it is and maybe it isn't. It depends on the situation. So in IBGP, we realistically need all our IBGP speakers to speak to everybody else because router A doesn't know how to reach router B. Now that's a problem. Now we have two workarounds. Workaround one, 
create an IBGP pairing session. Now router B can tell router A about its routes and everything works. So let's think about this. We have to fully mesh our IBGP peers because it's non-transitive. If A would tell C and C would tell B, everything would work perfectly. So we now have two options. We have the option to turn router C into something called a route reflector. And what is a route reflector? A route reflector is a rule that says violate the non-transitive routing in BGP. What does that mean? It then means, quite frankly, if router B tells router C about the routes, once you told it it's a route reflector, router C will then tell router A. And now router A can reach router B through router C. Pretty nice, right? Perfect. So why did we come up with this crazy idea of a route reflector to violate the IBGP rules that state that it's non-transitive and must be fully meshed? So I want you to think about this. When it comes to fully mesh, you need a lot of links. So the formula is this, and I'm not Mr. Math. N times N minus one divided by two. So Mike's not Mr. Math. My wife, Mrs. Math, but I am not. So let's say 10. Let's say we've got 10 routers. 10 times 10 minus one, which is nine equals 90 divided by two equals 45 connections. So you've got two of these, three of these, no big deal. Three routers, three connections. N times N minus one divided by two. N times, so three times three minus two, which equals one equals six divided by two equals three. It's easy. Now 100 BGP speakers. 100 times 99 divided by two. Now we're getting into a, what, 909,990? 9, oh, it's in my head. Divided by two, it's a large number. So let's not even go there. And maybe I shouldn't be doing math in my head. My wife can do calculus in her head, but you know, I'm not my wife. It's got 170 IQ. It's kind of cool, but it's neither here nor there. So we created a route reflector. Now, where does this come into play on the cloud? Well, in the cloud, we do a lot of VPC pairing, right? Is VPC pairing transitive? No. Why? Because they don't want you to become transit. So they assume you don't know BGP and they make it non transit. So what does the cloud providers let you do? They make up a route reflector. This route reflector is 30 years old. So they come up with the concept of a cloud hub or a transit gateway, which basically is the same BGP route reflector that says, hey, router A, when you give routes to router C, tell router B about it. And then you don't have to fully mesh your IBGP peers. So kind of cool, huh? You can see in the cloud what we're doing to get past this non-transitive routing is exactly what we network engineers and architects did with Cisco 30 years ago. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. That's why when I say when you learn your fundamentals, you will always, always, always be good. I learned this 30 years ago. Whether it's AWS, Azure, Google, Dell, Cisco, Palo Alto, Cloud, it's all the same. That's why we're working so much on the fundamentals. So we've got this. We've played with it. So let's think about it. So everybody tell me now, what is the purpose of the interior gateway protocol? Why do we use an interior gateway protocol internally? Tell me in the chat box. What's the point? I know you know. Tell me, why are we using an interior gateway protocol internal to organization. What two, what things do we need? Pushing traffic through the internal network, exactly. What else, Margin? Do we need reachability for our IBG peers loop back to loop back? Yeah. Do we need, as Robert said, speed and recovery around cable cuts, our routers? Yes. We need to enable packets like Kenya said to get from router to router. Good answers, good answers, excellent answers. That's exactly what we need. Get our packets, our data from point A to point B. You guys are doing it. You guys are like magic today. Reachability, Mark Bourne, perfect. So the interior gateway protocols, speed, convergence, self-healing fast, fast, fast. Now we need IBGP to carry BGP routing information across our organization. Why can't we take the 8 million routes from BGP and just dump them into OSPF or an IGP? Well, the interior gateway protocol is not designed 
to handle that many routes. So because that interior gateway protocol is not, if we take the BGP information and dump it into our IGP, we just break the IGP. But we need that IGP to get the routers to talk to each other. Good stuff. And why are we using BGP right now? Why are we using BGP? Well, we're using BGP for the following region. It gives us scale and tunability. It does that. So BGP is different than other questions. Most other routing protocols do a multicast hello to find each other. Does BGP find each other or do we have to tell it who the manual neighbor is? Do we manually specify the neighbor? Do we manually connect to it over any port? What is the protocol that's used for the BGP pairing session and what is the port? It's a test question. And if you ever need to work with BGP, you're gonna to have to open this port on the firewall. Is it TCP or UDP and what is the port number? Everybody let me know in the chat box. Margin, it is TCP. What port? And port 179. Robert, good job. TCP port 179. Deuce World, TCP port 179. Queen, yes. TCP port 179. And Ruth, Lion Lord, that's a cool name. I always love Lions. Elvis, 179. But you get it next time. Saeed, TCP port 179. And Chow over there, back with the blue ranch. Thank you for everything, Chow. Mark Bourne, TCP port 179. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So, two roots. Same prefix. One has a local preference of 1,000. One has a local preference of 50. Do I take the local preference of 1,000 or do I take the local preference of 50? Good to see you again, Sarah Severs Beamer. Which do I take, the 1,000 or the 50? Which one? Which local preference do I take? Prefer the path with a higher local preference. So, Marjan, 1,000. Saeed, 1,000. Kenya, Carl, yes, 1,000. Exactly. Now, I've got two routes. One has a weight of 32768, and one has a route of 32769. Which one do I take? Good job, Io. Brian. Ruth, you've been doing so good. It's pretty fantastic. Robert, exactly. Ruth, 32769, because it's higher. Now, I've got two routes in my BGP table. One has an origin code of IGP. One has one of incomplete. Which one? Which one? Do I take the origin code of the IGP or the origin code of incomplete? IGP is greater than incomplete. Exactly. IGP is greater than EGP, which is better than incomplete. Excellent. Excellent. So, good. I have a path that has an AS path of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And I have another AS path for the same route that is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Which do I take? The one that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5? Or the one that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Which one? Tell me, tell me, tell me. Margin. Good. The one, two, three, four, five, the shorter path. Excellent. 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 So are you guys curious? how we connect to multiple internet service providers? Is that something you wanna know? Let me know. And Mike, um, before yes. we move on to the next thing, let's, uh, let's 
allow some time for these to clear out just because we asked those pretty quickly back to back. Good so, idea. So answers from like three questions ago are still coming in on some of them. So, okay. <laughs> so you could talk about the, the webinar tomorrow, the coaching session on Friday, uh, the sunny skies outside here in Florida, you know, or at least good. And actually, in my part of Florida. <laughs> actually, Chris is right. So we had a couple of weeks where it was like 60 degrees outside and we Florida people were not happy. My cat would walk outside in the morning. She'd take three steps. She'd look at me and she'd run right back and jump up in my lap. She was not happy uh, because it was like 60 degrees. And quite frankly, uh, my body, because of the injuries I've had in martial arts, is not too good. I've been spending hours per day in my 130 degree room just trying to hide out in there. And it's bright and sunny right now, which makes me really, really happy and excited. But a uh, the, the couple of things to talk about is I do want to know that you come join us on our How to Get Your Free Cloud Architect job tomorrow. It's realistically speaking, I want to help you and I want you all getting cloud hired. So let's talk about, we'll come, we'll talk about what hiring managers desire, what a real cloud architect is, what we really do, how to become uh, highly technically competent and capable, um, how to get past the hiring, how to get to the hiring manager and not get blocked by HR, those kind of things. So, you know, kind of keep that in the back of your mind. You know, there's something like that. Uh, also, I want you to join that. Also, on, on Friday, we're going to have a free interview session. I've been coaching interviews now for 20 years. I've never had an interview for which I didn't get hired because I studied interviews for so long. My students get hired every single day. And a lot of that has to do with our special interview techniques, our interview tactics, our knowledge and research of hiring managers, our knowledge and recruit research of CIOs. We've asked thousands and thousands and thousands of hiring managers. So we are real experts at in getting people to pass interviews and we'd love to see you join us and it's completely free. So join us. Definitely join us. So before we go on to anything else, does anybody have any questions with me? Any questions on anything we've covered so far? And I'll probably walk you through some ISP design and multi-homing to give you a feel for it. And maybe what we'll do is we'll create a high availability, high reliability, multi-cloud architecture using BGP. Does that sound fun, everybody? Let me know, chat box. Or if you guys are all tired and you just want to take a nap, let me know that in the chat box and I'm okay too. Otherwise, I will go if you want more. We can call it a day. We covered a lot of BGP, but you guys are in charge. Let me know in the chat box. Multi-cloud, type in either multi-cloud with ISP or nappy time. Keep going. We can keep doing that. Uh, so why did these protocols call the stack? I don't really know. Uh, I'm not a programmer, but sometimes they call it the TCP IP protocol stack just because uh, what's going on is we've got multiple protocols there. Saeed, yes, route reflectors is designed to reduce the number of IBGP connectors. Exactly. Multi-cloud, multi-cloud, high availability, multi-cloud with ISP. Yep, sure, we can do it. Seven series beamer sounds great. Margin sounds great. Let's have some fun with it. But yes, Saeed, that's exactly the reason why we do that to reduce the number of BGP connections. Abigail says, keep blazing through. Abigail's a veteran and, and she's definitely got the inner fight in her to keep going. So let's do it. Let's keep going. Let's start thinking about our multi-cloud environment and how do we make these multi-cloud environments really, really, really high availability. So before we do this, let's talk about why we would go multi-cloud and why you'd be insane not to. So when it comes to networking, there's a lot of principles. First principle is this, no single points of failure. Hi, Io, I'm so happy to see you there, Io. So happy to see you back, Brandon. No single points of failure. What is a single cloud? Single point of failure. You know, in AWS, they, they like to tell you, you can stick all your eggs in our basket and you're safe. Azure tells people to do multi-cloud. Google tells people to be, do multi-cloud. Nutanix tells people to do multi-cloud, but AWS seems to tell people they can do it on their cloud. Now, 
That's their perspective. I come up with classical networking background. I've been hired by the world's biggest banks, the world's internet service providers, the biggest and best in the world to say, Mike, we can't tolerate downtime. And if I told any of them single cloud, not only would I get laughed out of a job, my name would be destroyed and my replacements would take my job and thank me for it. Because the customers that I deal with that know high availability know no single point of failure. So how do we make this work? Well, we make no single points of failure. So right now, what we're going to teach you how to do is we're going to teach you how to design the kind of high availability multi-cloud networks that only maybe 1% of the most elite architects in the world will know. No one else will know this. So we're going to get into some deep, 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 high availability, high performance. And we'll just pop it into our BGP training, because why not? And what we're going to do is we're going to go through these high availability principles. They include no single points of failure. One is none, two is one, and three is greater than two. If something can happen, it will happen. The reason a single cloud is a single point of failure is as follows. The clouds all have a control plane or orchestration plane that determines where your VMs are or your storage. If that gets hacked or goes down, the entire cloud is dead. The cloud rides on a single network. Do you know what happens if the network goes down? The cloud is dead. The cloud gets hacked. You know what happens? The cloud can be dead. So that's what matters. So Robert, you need to learn the cloud, not a cloud. Robert, a virtual machine is the same virtual machine, whether you call it a virtual machine on VMware ESXi, a virtual machine on KVM or QEMU, an Azure virtual machine, an Oracle virtual machine, a Google Compute Engine instance, and an AWS EC2 instance. It's identical. Guess what? Block storage. Well, I'll say object storage. If you call it Amazon Simple Storage Solution, object storage with Dell EMC, or Microsoft Blob or Google Cloud Storage, it's the same thing. So Robert, don't waste your time learning any of these things from any vendor. Learn the tech, and then you know all the clouds. That's what you need to do. So remember why we're doing these things. High availability, no single points of failure. So if we have a single router connecting to the cloud, is that a single point of failure? Yes. If the router is, that connects to the cloud is plugged into a single outlet, is that a single point of failure? Yes. If we only have one link, is that a single point of failure? Yes. If the cloud gets hacked, do we have another cloud anymore? No, we're dead. If the cloud has a control plane failure, we're dead. If the cloud has a networking failure, like AWS's eight-hour networking thing because they somehow built a data center that didn't have redundant power, redundant generators, and redundant power companies, and they had a power outage that took down half of the global world. So not availability, not redundant. So how do we do it? What do we need to do? Let's talk about how we do this. So let's first talk about high availability ISP design. Well, what does high availability ISP design? Well, the internet has always been considered a cloud. So here's our internet. Internet. Now, that's our internet. Let's say we want to connect to the internet. What do we need to connect to the internet? We need a router. We got a router that connects to the internet. And we've got a second router that connects to the internet. Now let's say our business is dependent upon quality internet access, high performance internet access. Could we use a single internet service provider? No, our business is dependent upon the internet. So that means one is none, two is one, and three is greater than two. And if we want optimal internet performance, we might use four or five or six internet service providers because each one's gonna be closer. So let's do this. Let's take our router one, router one, and router two. Now, we would be insane to connect router one on AT&T and router two on AT&T. That would be about as bad of an idea as sticking all your eggs in a single cloud provider. So when people actually connect to the internet, they always, and have been taught for 30 years, always to use two different internet service providers. So we're going to do the same thing. So let's say we've got two 10 gig links to one ASP, 
uh, to two 10 gig links, uh, to two different internet service providers on one router, and two different internet service providers on another router. Now we've got four links to the internet. Let's say this one's AT&T, this is Verizon, this is NTT and CenturyLink. Why do we have two routers, not one? Because if the router dies, guess what? We're dead. So we're going to put a link between them. Now on these routers, we saw that AWS had a power failure and it took down their network. Do we want power failures? So what's going to happen with these routers? Each router, to put you into contact, is going to have two power supplies. Power supply is going to be plugged into outlet one. Power supply is going to be plugged into outlet two. So we will always have redundant power. Now how about the brain in these devices? Well, if the brain has a problem, the router goes down. So we'll put multiple brains or control modules. So each router that's going to connect to the internet should be a big router, have multiple power supplies, multiple brains, because one is none, two is one, and three is greater than two. Now, guess what? We've got two uh, internet connections on that router. Should they be on the same line card or a different card? Two cards, because the routers have cards. And if one of the card fails, you still want the router to work. So we're going to do this. Two routers, four connections, four different internet service providers, Different sets of power that plug into different power outlets. Now, in our data center, we're not AWS. We actually know how to build a data center. We are going to bring in our power from two power companies, separate companies. Then we're going to have generators. Guess what? We're going to have backup generators. And backup to our generators, we're going to have batteries to back it up. Data centers other than AWS do not go down from power failures because organizations use multiple discrete power. That's the way they all do it. How did AWS have a power failure? I don't know. Did they have a power failure? I don't know. But whatever the case is, we build our data centers around this. So that's what you're going to see in a real data center. Redundant power, redundant cooling everywhere. Now what you'll find is these are our, I, these are our routers, and then we're going to have our data center, and here's going to be our data center. Now what should we do in our data center if we're really good? Well, what I would do, I would probably install an OpenStack cloud or a Nutanix cloud like I have in my house. And that gives me auto scaling, agility, the ability to create what I need and load balance what I need instantly. That's what I would be doing and that's what I do personally. But let's just say it's a data center. Now, we're never going to be crazy enough to put all our eggs in one basket like a single cloud provider because we know that's just sheer insanity. So now what we're going to do is we want to have in our data center we want to have multiple routers. So we're going to have a router connecting to the cloud. Let's say this is router one. And let's say we've got two to connecting to the cloud provider. Or two. Let's, let's drag this stuff up a little bit more. I want to really give you the space to see it. Now we're also, while we're at it, in our data center, we're going to pop two more routers. Oops, I need to do that. So let's just, it's not going to be the prettiest thing. So now let's say we've got AWS over here. You always should pick a second cloud. I happen to love working with Azure. They're very friendly to work with, but they're all good. They're all great clouds. I mean, I may make a joke about AWS's explanations, but it's a good cloud. I just like to be honest with my people and say, if this happened, here's the problem. If this happened, here's that, as opposed to just not knowing because some of these answers. So this router connecting to AWS or both of them, you think we're gonna, we're gonna put uh, two power supplies on these routers? Yeah, power goes down, we lose our connection to the cloud. How about control modules? Should we need a war one? Yeah. How about if we have four fiber optic links and a link aggregation group will be spread across line cards? Yes. So this is what we're going to be doing. Now, how about Azure? Same thing. Two different direct connections or private lines, express route, whatever you want to call it, on two different environments. So this is how we do it. We, we take this. Now, let's think about the security and the integrity in this environment. 
between this internet and these routers and our data center, what devices do we have to keep our systems locked down? Do we have firewalls there? IDS, IPS systems? Access control lists, et cetera? Yeah, we do. No. Over here, let's say this is the site arranged for this. 10.0.0.0 slash .0 .0 .0 .0 16. Now let's say the site arranged for Azure is 10.1.0.0.16. Do I need, does Azure, if Azure doesn't need to talk to AWS, can I put a, can I, do I, I only need to take in the route, the 10 slash 0, .0 from AWS. And if I only learn this one route, If I learn this from my AWS links, granted we might want to load share in which case we tune them, but for just argument's sake, I just want to make life simple for you guys. In this particular environment, if AWS doesn't need to talk to Azure, I won't take AWS's routes in and give them to Azure. And I won't take Azure's routes and give them to AWS. Does that give me any security? If I don't pass AWS's information to Azure, and Azure's information doesn't go to AWS, can anybody think of how we've impacted security? Tell me about the security. Can If AWS get hacked, gets hacked in this environment, if AWS is hacked, now let's think about it, let's think about it, let's think about it. If AWS is hacked, can that... Your VPC and AWS is hacked. Can it hack? Can it affect Azure? No, you didn't give them the route. If Azure's hacked and you don't pass Azure's routing information to AWS, can AWS get hacked from Azure? No. Now, we want to make this better. What else are we going to use? We're going to use access control lists on these WAN links. We might use firewalls. We might even use IDS IPS systems. The point is, is we can lock our stuff down in between entities. And that's why we're using BGP for this, because it gives us the absolute ability to control who gets access to what, where, how, and why. If we don't share the root, we can't do it. And that's why we like this environment. So when you're dealing with this particular kind of environment, you're going to be running BGP to your internet service providers you're going to be running BGP to your cloud providers. And that way you can run your IGP in your entity that's good, strong, and performs well. From there, you can connect those two entities to external organizations, and poof, we've got high availability and high security. Now, does anybody, uh, is anybody curious about how we do the security in an environment like this? If you are, type security. Otherwise, you know, don't tell and uh, say... Uh, BGP is enough for the day I got a headache. Let me know in the chat box. Either just type BGP, meaning we're good with BGP, or if you want to know how to do multi-cloud security, we can talk about that too. Let me know with multi-cloud security, either BGP or multi-cloud security. Motivated bunch here. Love this. Okay, I'm liking this. I'm seeing security, security, security. Uh, Eugene says no more BGP. All right, Eugene, no more BGP. Um, but a lot of people are looking at security. I was looking at security. I am my super security guy. Are you also here looking for security? Because there's uh, there's an IO that's uh, that, there's an IO Flosia that's a really good security guy that I saw was here earlier. Okay, so. All right, there you go. I, you want to do security? Well, let's do some security. So uh, fantastic. Let's get involved in some multi-cloud security. Fun, fun stuff. So we came prepared. You guys are motivated. I just keep going. Uh, like Chris says, he knows me. I just do stuff on the fly. It's fun. So let's thank Chris for being pretty tolerant of this. 
So let's talk about security when we go multi-cloud. So each of the cloud providers have their own little security services, their own WAFs, et cetera, their web application firewalls. Now, I really want you to think about this logically. Who do you think focuses more on security? A company like Cisco that's had 30 years of security making, a company like Palo Alto that only does security, a company like Fortinet that only does security, or Amazon that's the world's largest retailer that does your virtual machines, your containers, your storage, custom databases, custom this, 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 this. this. Who do you think has a better security product? Well, I got to tell you this. If you go to a big bank and you ask them what kind of security, they're not looking for hobbyist grade, typical proprietary vendor services. They're looking for something rock solid, something really robust, made by the world's best security companies. Who are they? They're Checkpoint in Israel, they're Palo Alto Networks, they're Cisco, they're Fortinet, and they're Juniper. These companies make the world's best firewall. And they are rock solid. Incredible IDS, IPS systems. And if you care about your network, you're using one of them. So what do we use on the cloud? A vendor proprietary something that only works on a single cloud provider? Or something like from Cisco or Palo Alto that works on all the cloud providers, gives us more features, more functionality, and better security? Well, that's what we always use. So when we go multi-cloud, we got to toss out non most of the nonsense they teach us in certification, the proprietary services with the fancy names, and we swap them out with things that work everywhere. So let's start talking about how do we do it. Let's build ourselves a very high security cloud environment. So each cloud, every cloud we deal with is going to look this way. Because remember, imagine using cloud armor on Google and AWS WAF and Shield on AWS. Do you think you have the same pro firewall security? Of course you don't. You only you get little bits and pieces of each thing, and they're all going to be similar but different, and we don't want that. We want identical security policies. So let's begin. With a web application, you really want to block bad web requests before they reach your system. Because if they can't reach you, they can't hack you. So we typically use a content delivery network. Cloudflare, Akamai, CloudFront, Azure Content Delivery Network, whatever. Content Delivery Network. Why? Well, the Content Delivery Network caches things. So if a thousand of you go to the webpage www.gocloudcareers.com, the first person in, that typically hits the cache in a geography has to go to the server. If 999 other people hit the same cache, the web server only gets used once, so it can greatly increase the scalability of our systems and reduce the impact of a DDoS attack. Now, additionally, content delivery networks won't forward good requests to the server. So here we got an evil hacker They're trying to send some bad requests to our servers. The content delivery networks just drop them. Isn't that pretty cool? So content delivery network, generally speaking, our first line of defense in web applications. Now, behind that, we need a firewall, but we need a good firewall, a robust firewall. We're not looking for hobbyist grade firewalls. We're looking for high security things. So that means Cisco, Palo Alto, Juniper, we got to go to a security company. Now, has anybody gone to the cloud provider recently, opened up the door to the cloud provider, brought in some racks and a drill, screwed them in, zip, 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 cabled it up, in there, plugged them into the racks and the, and, and the cloud providers, plugged in your ethernet cables and you were up. Has anybody ever done that? No. And here's why. The cloud providers won't let you in their buildings. They're physically secured, so you can't get there. So now how do you deal with a firewall? Well, in all the cloud providers that when you need high security, you go to the marketplace. And that's where you buy your Palo Alto or your Cisco device. These are good, strong devices. So we go there. Now, where do these devices reside? On virtual machines. Are virtual machines high availability devices? Of course they're not. They just go down and they crash. We got nothing. So what do we need? What do we need? We need one is none, two is one, and three is greater than two. 
three is greater than two. So what we're going to do on three cloud providers is use the same single vendor's firewall on all of our cloud providers. The same Palo Alto, this is going to be identical on everyone. So how do we, is there any special device that enables us to improve performance and remove single points of failure in virtual machine world? What is that device that enables you to load share across virtual machines and remove virtual machines if they fail via health tech? It's a load balancer. Load balancers improve performance and availability. So the first thing we're going to need now is a network load balancer because we're going to need the network load balancer to load balance our virtual firewalls. And then, of course, we're going to need virtual firewalls. So this will be firewall one, and we'll have another firewall. And the load balancer will load balance our firewalls. Pretty cool stuff, right? Okay, so now... We've got our firewalls there. Now let's assume for right now, we're not using a next generation firewall or we are, but we want secondary intrusion detection, intrusion prevention devices. So how do we make that work? Well, we need another network load balancer. And then after that, what are we gonna do? We're gonna have our IDS IPS system. And of course, we're going to have these sitting on both clouds, or three clouds, or as many clouds as we use. Where do these IPS, IPS systems reside? Where do these virtual firewalls sit? They sit on virtual machines. So on every cloud provider, we're going to do this. We're going to keep the bad requests from hitting us in the content delivery network. Then we're going to build this firewall. The firewall is like a giant wall around a castle. Picture a wall that's 3,000 feet high, and there's no ladder. You can't climb it. That's the firewall. Now, behind the firewall, we have an intrusion detection prevention system. So let's say we're going to build a firewall. And let's say I was building the castle. Here's what I would do. I would have this 3,000-foot wall, so you're not climbing over it. And in the event somebody managed to climb over the wall, I would have this big, giant moat. And I would fill it with sharks and alligators and crocodiles. And on the edge of the moat, I would have lions and tigers and bears. I guess I should say, oh, my. But I would have lions and tigers and bears, and they'd be growling. So why? If you manage to get past my firewall, which you won't, and you happen to get there, I've got this intrusion detection, intrusion prevention. They're my, my sharks and lions and bears. They eat you. They eat you if you get through. So stop it at the content delivery network. Block it at the firewall. And if you get past the firewall, you get eaten by lions. That's the intrusion detection, intrusion prevention. Sharks, lions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. So then... How do we protect our subnets in a cloud or, or a data center? We put an access control list on a router. Is there anything we can do on our servers and cloud providers to keep traffic from getting into a server? Yeah, they also have security groups. Network security groups, security groups. It's kind of like a host-based firewall. Do we think we're good? This isn't enough. Now about what about our servers? And you it's just like peeling an onion towel. How about our servers? The servers themselves, are they locked down? Of course they're not. They're not locked down. What do we want to do on the servers? Well, maybe when we want to uh, put a host-based firewall, maybe we should put some uh, endpoint protection. For example, anti-malware. What about disabling unnecessary services? We want to leave every every service open. What about vulnerabilities? Do we close them down? Of course we do. So we're going to patch it. We're going to disable unnecessary services. Now, do we think this is enough? So let's say uh, Chow wants to knock on my door. What's the first thing I'm gonna do? I'm gonna look through the peeping window and I'm gonna say, oh, that's Chow. And I'm gonna say, Chow made it to my house in Florida. Chow, welcome, welcome. I'm gonna be real excited that she's there. And I'm gonna say, Chow, you visited me in Florida. Here's the keys to the house. Here's the key to the car. You go out there, you stay with me, you visit, you have a good time. That's what I'm gonna do for Chow. Now. Next, 
somebody knocks on the door and I don't know who they are, so I don't let them in. What's that called? Authentication, authorization, and accounting, otherwise known as identity and access management. What do most enterprises use for identity and access management? They use Microsoft Active Directory. All of them. So whether you're using an AD connector or Azure AD, you're probably going to use that everywhere. Should we be encrypting our data that we store? Yeah. So if we're with Azure, it's automatically encrypted. With AWS, we have to enable the key management system. But in either case, we're getting AES 256-bit encryption. We're starting to sense a trend here. What about look at analyzing our software flows to see what's going on? Cisco, we have Net, NetFlow. AWS gives us something called VPC flow logs. Would it be good to make sure that we know what's going on with our traffic? Sure. We need to know this. Absolutely. So everybody here's thinking about it now. We get logs coming in. Log, 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 log. We get logs from the firewalls, logs from the IDSs, logs from the ACLs, logs from the security group, logs from our host-based firewall stuff, logs from content delivery network, Microsoft AD stuff, all this cool stuff. All of it. You think we got a lot of information coming in, everybody? Yeah, we do. All kinds of crazy amounts of information. If we really want to be high-end security and adaptable, now we're talking way above military-grade security, what we're talking about now. This is really elite security. Might it make sense to take, say, the logs and the flow logs and all this other data? Could we take this data? Might it make sense to take this data and send it to something like uh, Kafka for the streaming data? Might it then make sense to take this data and put it into a visualization engine? So by doing this, we can actually see what's going on with our systems. And heck, if we really wanted to, before we even got to the visualization tool, we could easily run some machine learning so we can kind of get even more, uh, even more kind of stuff going on and then we could evaluate the results. So, you know, when we're dealing with enterprise security and we're really trying to be robust, what we're dealing with is layers. Layers, 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 layers. You gotta know what's going on. You gotta be able to adapt to it, compromise it. And if we start using cloud proprietary services, we can't do this because look at it this way. AWS and Azure have a content delivery network. They both have network load balancers. They both have marketplace firewalls. They both have marketplace IDS solutions. They both have access control and security groups. On your virtual machines, you can do all of this. You can use Microsoft AD on both. 256-bit encryption on both. Traffic flow logs get on both. All of this works on everyone. Why? Because we haven't used a single proprietary service. Now, use an AWS proprietary anything, and this changes. Well, that's why we're using Kafka versus Kinesis for that reason. So we wouldn't use QuickSight. We'd use Power BI or Tabula or something as a visualization tool. The point is there's so many wonderful things for us to use. And we go vendor neutral. I can do this in my data center. In the data center, this is a physical F5 load balancer. This is physical firewalls from Cisco and physical maybe from CrowdStrike, for example. Now in a data center, it's just virtual. It's the same. So now I've got an OpenStack cloud doing this or Nutanix cloud local data center, connected to the Azure cloud doing this, and the Google cloud doing this, and the AWS cloud. Now, you tell me you've got a hybrid cloud, multi-cloud environment in the most secure environment. There is nothing you can do. AWS has an outage. Who cares? Azure has an outage. Who cares? You have an outage. Who cares? You're up and you're running, and that's what businesses need to do. Business cannot survive downtime. You know, Slack was down. Half of the U.S. could barely work for a day yesterday. How that happened? Well, well, we're not exactly going to know. But how Slack and how all these big AWS customers were down yesterday and uh, the AWS service dashboard was perfect, not sure. 
you know, we never know where it is. It could be on the customer side or the AWS side. It's kind of hard to find these things. But the point is, that's what we're doing. That's the way these things are designed. Now, for the students in my cloud architect career development program, we talk about DMZ design and where the web servers need to be and the VPN concentrators. But I just wanted you guys to get a feel for how you would use BGP in a multi-cloud environment, meaning all the WAN connections you get, all the LAN connections that you get, who needs to talk to whom, and that's realistically what we're talking about. So I'd like to open it up. Are there any questions for me? And actually, before you guys ask questions, if you can type hashtag cloud hired, makes me happy. Uh, I like to see it. I know that you guys are awake, alert, and oriented. Plus, you know, my favorite thing, I mean, honestly, and Chris knows this and Leo knows this, is when somebody calls me at night and says, hey, Mike, I just got hired. I'm like, it's the best thing news for me. So everybody type hashtag cloud hired. And then after that, any questions that you desire, I'll happily answer. Did you answer the question about the DMC? Um, yes. Okay. I thought, I thought so. I just wanted to make sure. For that one, uh, that sounds like uh, Thursday's class. We'll do a nice class on DMZ design. Douglas G, you want to read about BGP? I recommend the book Internet Routing Architectures from Bassam Halabi. It's an old book. I've read it at least 100 times. Each time I read it, I picked out something good. It's my absolute favorite book. Otherwise, I always go to the Internet Engineering Task Force page, type in all the BGP RFCs, and read the actual specifications. That is the most best source, and I've read all of them too. Of course, I also read the Cisco documentation, the Juniper R documentation, and everywhere in between. Architects will definitely need to know the tools for interconnection. Um, but realistically speaking, Danica, you could do all of this on BGP and not use any of that Aviatrix or Nutanix, anything. It is not necessary. You can use every, the, all of this can be done via BGP. There are, uh, they are using other additional ways to do it, to create cloud interconnections. In this case, I wouldn't connect my clouds at all. I would connect my data center with the cloud and in most cases leave my data in the data center because it's cheaper that way and it's more secure that way. My data is in my data center. My clouds can access it. And guess what? If the data is in the data center, you don't even have to pay to get your data to the cloud because data to the cloud is free, whereas data to not the cloud. So architects do need to understand how to design this, but we don't configure. We don't use the tools. We don't use Aviatrix. We are not engineers. We are architects. So it's all about design. So we do need to know how to design it. But in general, these other tools are more cloud to cloud. In many cases, we're going to go data center to multiple clouds. By doing, Danica, what we showed you without using any of the Aviatrix type things, we have much more security and firewallness and robustness. The Aviatrix tools, and they're beautiful multi-cloud, multi-cloud networking tools. They make life a little easier. I'm teaching you the hard way to do it versus the tools that make life easier. But as a rule, manual design and optimization is always better than things that are more automatic. But love Aviatrix. A lot of the Cisco people I know are working there and they're all smart. So it is fantastic. I almost took a director position at Nutanix a couple of years ago because I loved it. I think they're a great company. One of the best clouds I know. Mander, how does BGP work with the link aggregation group? Well, interesting and good question. Mander, the reason people use link aggregation groups is as follows. They don't have to get involved in complicated routing. So here's what a link aggregation group is for people that don't know. Here's one wire. Now we've got two wires. Now we've got three wires. So what a link aggregation group is, port channel, ether channel, whatever you want to call it, is when you take these separate wires, and instead of looking like separate cables, you make them logically look to the router like one. Because we're Mandar, and this is a great question, we're making the four cables look like one, it's a single cable, which means if we have layer two things, we have no spanning tree problems, we're not blocking any of these links, 
on layer three links, it does not look like three or four equal cost links. It looks like one link. So when you're using BGP with a link aggregation group, it makes all those links look like one. So that means you would naturally be load sharing on all four links without prepending ASs and changing anything. So it is the simplest and most elegant way. And Mandar, if you've got four 10 gig links, for example, in a link aggregation group, and one of the links goes away, you still have three more. So it's high availability, high performance, and elegant and super easy routing. Best thing ever invented is a link aggregation group. <clears throat> what would I use as a machine learning tool? Well, here's the thing, Robert. I am not a machine learning engineer, a custom an architect, but there's all these good libraries, PyTorch, TensorFlow, et cetera, et cetera. And you know where they work? On every cloud and the data center. So you know what kind of tools I'd probably be using? The interoperable tools that will work anywhere. But Robert, if in all seriousness, if I was not, if I didn't have big data scientists working for my company and I had a lot of machine learning and I was looking for something quick and I had a small team, Google has some extremely good pre-made artificial intelligence machine learning libraries. Amazon has them too, as does Microsoft. But look at it this way. When I go to somebody, I like to go to the people that have the most experience. I go to Cisco, Checkpoint, Palo Alto, and Fortinet for security because they have the most experience. Who is the number one algorithm creator in the world? Who is the number one search engine in the world? Google. Who is the number two search engine? YouTube. Who would I go to for machine learning capabilities if I didn't want to have my team make it myself? I would go to them. That's their world. They are the algorithm makers. I'd be going to Google. But I'd prefer to hire people that can just build it from scratch. How does one determine the number of firewalls to use? For example, why two firewalls? Well, you can never use less than two firewalls because if one firewall fails, your whole network fails. So that's why we use two firewalls. I will never use less than two because the firewall is your connection. As the firewall dies, everything goes, all your web apps, everything's done. So you can have your firewall fail in one of two methods. Open, where you hacked if they fail, and close, where if they fail, you've got nothing. Neither one of them would be an acceptable solution. So. How many firewalls do you need? Well, it depends on the performance limitations of the firewalls. If you have 10 ter if you have a terabit internet connection, chances are you might need a dozen firewalls, 20, 30 to, to handle it because you don't have enough capacity on a single firewall. But you're always going to use two. And the reason you must use at least two, and two is usually enough for most situations, you have to have a primary and a backup in case one fails. But uh, usually two, because you can put them on some pretty big virtual machines. But at some point, depending upon the amount of traffic, you might need more than two. But two is a minimum. So Mandar. So if you ever remember the T1 lines and the E1 lines and this concept of multiplexing and inverse multiplexing, multiplexing or was when you would basically take something and you would get a section of it per second. And inverse multiplexing was basically like Multi-linking, where you would put multiple links together. Mandar maybe worked with a WAN or ISDN that was the point-to-point -point protocol, where you bundled two uh, 64K DSOs into a single 128K link, et cetera, et cetera. That's the same kind of thing. It's just bundling two links to look at one. But it was a great question you answered, that, Mandar. Truly fantastic question. Any others, Chris? That is it for now. Okay, well, let's say this. If anybody has any questions, let me know and we'll do them. Otherwise, type AWS BGP training in the chat box. And if you haven't issued a like or a comment or a subscribe and you're willing to, please do so. We work really, really hard to basically create and foster an environment to help everybody get cloud hired. So if you could let us know, that would make us feel great. Um, with, a, with an AWS BGP training in the chat box. Myerson, I think we can uh, do that on one of the Tuesday or Thursday classes. Absolutely.
love seeing this. So we've got some from uh, some of the wonderful folks that are on the call. And also let us know where you're from. I always love knowing this. It, 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 it's fantastic uh, you know, to see how many people are coming from all over the world to these kind of sessions. So I love it. Let us know where you're from. Arizona, I love that. Maryland. CJ, you're over there in Maryland. Mark, I always remember that you're in New York. Mark, I spoke to Christina on your behalf the other day. Um, let's see who else is here. Costa Rica, I love that. That's a place I haven't been to in a long time. Margins in the Netherlands, that's fantastic. Dallas, Texas site. I haven't been there in a while, but I used to go there almost once a week. Love it over there, actually. Ruth, uh, thank you so much. I try very hard, so this makes me very happy. Lion Lord, South Carolina. That's a nice and warm place. Gene, Atlanta, Georgia. I went there three times last year. Love that area, especially Peachtree City, etc. Anthony from Raleigh, North in Raleigh from San Juan. Wow, I've been to San Juan in a long time. I have spent a lot of time, Mark, in Glasgow, Scotland, and absolutely loved it. Tosin, that's right. You're in Winnipeg, Canada. That's right. Douglas is, uh, that's right. You have a New Jersey phone number. You told me you were in Washington, D.C. That's fantastic. Calgary, I.O., that's really fantastic. So, and Deuce, you're in France. Fantastic. Ciao. Hi, Mike. You wonder if there's an occasion where your client says that multiple firewalls are too costly and they won't want to pay for it. Ciao. I've never seen that. And uh, I will tell you, there was at one point, I did have a customer that was a little concerned about the cost of security. And I had a very simple conversation with them. And I said, how big of a target do you believe you are as what you're worth, what you're doing? And they said, huge. I said, what is the cost to tell one person that you've been compromised? They said $176 per person. I said, uh, how many people do you have in your database? And they said a few hundred thousand. I said, here's the cost of an outage. And we were upwards in the $100 million range. And then they said, I said, how's that million dollar security architecture feeling to you now? And I've never, never had a problem with that. But it's building a business case. Elvis, that's right. You're Cameroonian. I remember that. Fantastic. Queen in Petersburg, England. That's fantastic. Oji, you're probably Nigerian with that name, but I could be wrong. Io is obviously Ni Nigerian in Maryland. Fantastic. Mandar's over there in Daleks. I love that. Chow is freezing in Daleks. I have heard this. I have friends. They're all telling me there. Leonardo de Souza, Brazilian in Germany. I love that. William Byrne. Why am I thinking you're in England, William Byrne? Uh, and JFK is in London. I like that. Kenya Carl's Atlanta. Yeah, 70 degrees is pretty nice. London, UK. Haven't been there in a few weeks. And Sean is actually Trinidadian, living over there in Germany, which I think is great. And I love the energy here. Saudi Arabia. Haven't been there in a little while, but I had lots of fun the last time I was there. Danica, Cloud Hard, and Moses, New Mexico. Moses, I think you're the pro athlete, my student. I hope so. Brian McCool. Wow, I grew up in Philadelphia. Raining in Phoenix, Arizona today. Good day for classes. I love that. Abigail Marks, you concur freezing in Dallas. That's right. Oh, so Abigail and Chow and some of my students, you know, we don't have a school. We have a family. And last night I saw a picture of Abigail and Chow and so many wonderful, wonderful people. They were all getting together and collaborating. And Chow, that melted my heart when I saw it. So uh, absolutely love it. So thrilled to see that, and thank you for all your help and all that magical Blue Reds work that you're doing. Good to have you back from Vietnam. Poon, India. Fantastic, Matt. And Queen OG, yes, you are. Fantastic. So many people from that part of the world becoming great cloud architects. I saw NGWEs in Cambodia, which is fantastic. Yeah, these are those photos. This just, I see Balwinder's there. I see Eva, who's amazing there. I see Abigail over there. And uh, there's just so many really wonderful people there. When I saw this last night, I was just so happy. Chris sent it to me. And that's what I like to see. I like to see my students working together from all over the world for one goal, 
to get each other hired. And my students, whether that's Chinton over there, I mean, they're all working together and that is the best feeling ever. We are the United Nations of the cloud. And I speak Greek in the house, Roberto. So, you know, that's the key. We're all from different parts of the world. Gabriel from, from in Ontario, Robert, welcome back. Chow, see Chow, we all missed you when you were over there in Vietnam. Kwasi, coming Georgia, I absolutely love that. And Margin, wow, so cool. I think it's neat, you know, Margin there, you're there in the Netherlands. And Gabriel is obviously Nigerian, living in Canada. Um, so I love that. Uh, we've got Muhammad over there in Pakistan. I'm so happy you're passing interviews now, Ken Adam. Go out there and get yourself cloud hired. So why we do everything we do. Thank you so much, Queen Oji. Over there in Pakistan, Muhammad, that's fantastic. We had a great time. I love this family too. You know, when my wife asked me what's my favorite part of what I do, I said, the family. She's like, what do you mean? I said, yeah, everybody's talking together. They're working together. It's like a dream come true. Good to see you over there, Iowa and Maryland. So, everyone, I want you to have a wonderful... Oh, Mumbai, India. That's really fantastic. Thank you so much. I don't know if they actually posted it on Slack or not, but... Yeah, it, it was posted in the Hangouts channel on Slack. Oh, that's where you filmed it. Yeah. I mean, where else? That's, yeah, they're hanging out. <laughs> Denava Danica. And Danica, actually, you know, we, we're pretty excited now. We now speak English, Greek, Spanish, and Portuguese. We're Portuguese in our, in our organization, and we need to add some more languages. So we're pretty excited about those. Thank you, Marjan. Um, I couldn't be more honored by you saying you think the community is a reflection of your love and teaching and guiding and our passion. Thank you, Marjan. And Ruth, uh, you saw it on Slack. That's great. So I'm just going to call out the uh, people in Atlanta. I know that there's uh, quite a few people in Atlanta. If the people in Dallas can do it, <laughs> I think the people in Atlanta can do something. Actually, just, while we're at I'm, it, I'm, since I'm, there's I'm, about a hundred of you left it. over, if any of you guys want any specific videos, if you want to give us suggestions for YouTube videos, we'll take them into consideration, run them through my team and see if we have the ability to make them. So, are there any any particular YouTube videos any of you guys are really searching for? If you could let us know in the chat box. Love to get others' perspective. Want to make you all happy. Want to see where you're all struggling or what you need to learn. I know what I see, but, you know, really do aim to please and make everybody happy. Really want to build a family for you guys so you have everything you need. And if there's nothing more to say, I uh, um, and we'll say we have a really great day. Uh, can I pop the security diagram back up? I think that could be arranged. Data center videos. Okay, can, we can arrange some of that. One of these days, I will organize a Palm Beach meetup where anybody that wants to come that comes to Palm Beach, we can all maybe hang out one day. I think it would be kind of fun. Maybe I'll teach a yoga class to a few hundred people on the beach. Make it a beach day, a party day. Okay, so data center, sure, Ruth, I think we can make that happen. Um, you guys in Maryland, I love that. Okay, well, um, thank you so much, uh, CJ, for sure. Ruth, you agree. I love this. You guys find each other, communicate with each other, and go find a way to really build your best career. Build yourself a network. You know, they say your network is your net worth, and truth be told, there's a lot to be said for that. I will tell you how I design things. Everything I do is a team sport. I find the best security people, the best IM people, yes, it's a separate career, the best big data people, the best database people, best security people, I bring them all in a room. And you know what? When you make a team and you've got a lot of people and they work together, wow, that's the best result. So go out there and meet people, form relationships. Guess what? You really want to be successful? 
form relationships with people that are different than you. Here's the reason. Imagine 10 people that all grew up in Philadelphia, where I went to school, that all went to Temple University, that all took the same classes, that all feel the same way. Now we've got a problem. Guess what? We're all the same person. We don't have any solutions. But I got a security person. I got a network person. I got a data center person. I've got this person from Greece this person from Brazil, this person from Ethiopia, this person from India, different training, different education, different backgrounds, different career backgrounds. Wow, you've got solutions to some problems. So that's kind of there. So uh, thank you so much for all of your kind words. I see what you're saying, oh, Carter Drew, thank you so much. And yeah, let's do it. Let's get over and thank you, Chow. Robert, I'm glad you had fun. I always have fun talking about tech. And Carter, thank you. Mike, we can tell you love what you, I do. And Robert, uh, thank you so much. Marjan, it was so much fun. So thank you so much. Thanks to the moderators with these great blue wrenches. We love all of you, and we're so grateful for your help. Thank you so much there, Ruth. Okay, everyone, have a wonderful night. It was such an honor and a privilege to spend the afternoon with you. Please join us tomorrow on our How to Get Your First Cloud Architect Job webinar. And on Friday, please make sure you're registered for the interview session. The interview session will help you in so many ways. Either you participate and get coached, or you get to watch and you get to see what your competition strengths and weaknesses are. By doing this, you'll know how to be better prepared. As they say in the art of wear, know yourself, know your enemy, and you'll always be victorious. Know yourself and not your enemy. For every win, there'll be one loss. Know not yourself, but know your enemy. For every win, there'll be one loss. Don't know yourself, don't know your enemy. You'll always lose. So I'm bringing you the intel. You can actually go spy and see what others are out there in the industry. What others know, and you know how to be the best. So you can win that interview competition and get, guess what? Cloud hired. And you know what? Cloud paid more and cloud promoted. Be the best you possibly can be, and you'll be there. So to register for the interview sessions, how do they do that, Chris? I'm about to pop a link in the chat box. We'll pop a link in the chat box before we go. Register, it'll be a great time, and we will coach you so you will know exactly how to build yourself the best career. So I've just put it in the chat box. Okay, so there you go. Uh, super thrilled you were here, Io. Um, Io, I know we went a long time before you joined us, and it's been a real honor. And uh, Queen, thanks so much. And Sean, cheers. So see you all very soon. I will see you all tomorrow or the next day, whichever days you can join us.